Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the planning board meeting for May 18th, 2021. My name is Carrie Marnack. I'm chair of the planning board. Before we get started, I'm going to read a few announcements. This open meeting of the planning board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, the town of Northboro has been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of the planning board are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order allows the planning board to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. The public is encouraged to follow along using the postage agenda. Members of the public who wish to view the live stream of this meeting may do so by going to the North Bar Remote Meetings on YouTube via the link listed on the agenda. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Um, I'd like to confirm that board members are remotely present and can be heard by stating the following. Members, when I say your name, please respond in the affirmative. Amy Paretsky. Here. Anthony Zaiden. Here. Millie Milton. Oh, one more time, Millie, I didn't hear you. Here. Oh, thanks. And Michelle Gillespie. Here. Um, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Kathy Dubert. Here. And Fred Litchfield. Here. Okay, for ground rules, I will invite each speaker on the agenda by name to make a presentation and speak to their application. Participants will write their full name and hold until their name is called. Each speaker will be asked to mute their phone or computer when not speaking and to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate meeting minutes. Those responding will be asked to wait until the floor is yielded to them by the chair. Speakers who wish to respond to the comments of others do so through the chair, taking care to identify themselves. Each vote taken by the board or committee will be conducted by roll call vote. Um, after members have spoken, I will afford public comments as follows. By phone, dial star nine to raise your hand and wait to be recognized by the chair. Please note the party phone number will be visible to those of you in the meeting. By Zoom, click raise hand on the bottom of your screen and wait to be recognized by the chair. The chair will ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, the chair will call on each by name and afford approximately three minutes for comments. So with that, why don't we get started with this evening's agenda. First on the agenda, we have the election of officers. Um, we just had an election and welcome back to Anthony. Um, why don't we start with that? Would anyone like to make a nomination for the position of chair? I nominate Carrie Martinek as chair. Is there, the a, board? Is there a second? second. <laughs> okay, all in favor, Amy? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Millie? Aye. Michelle? Aye. And would anyone like to make a nomination for our vice chair of the planning board? I'd like to nominate Amy Perevsky as vice chair. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, Amy? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Millie? Aye. Michelle? Aye. And Carrie's an aye. I just want to um, quickly congratulate Carrie and Anthony too for the oh, recent thanks. election. Yeah. I'm not sure I voted for the first, um, for the chair position, but <laughs> okay, we'll say I did. Okay. Um, you know what, do we ever vote on a clerk? I don't think we ever officially did a clerk. What, what does a clerk do? Um, the, the, in, in the past, what the, what the clerk um, had, had done was their name appeared on the, the legal ads that went into the newspaper. And year, many years ago, we switched it over to the chairman. Um, so I don't, I don't think that there's been a clerk for All quite right, a I don't think so either, but yeah. it, it struck me. Okay, great. Well, moving on, we have the continued public hearing for 425 Whitney Street, special permit site plan approval and special permit for groundwater protection overlay district. So why don't we, um, Jim, are you bringing in people? Yeah, do you just want the, um, do you want Steris in at this point or do you want the peer reviewers? Um, no, you can, you can bring in, well, I guess it doesn't matter. We can bring in, we can start with the peer reviewers. See if anyone has any additional questions. So I have uh, Dave Dineski, uh, Scott Turner, and Don Flaherty. I do not see Ron, but I do see a phone number. Um, 
So I don't know if Ron's out there, if you can raise your hand and I can move you over. Maybe not, I don't see. Well, that's okay. Was he planning to attend, do we know? Was he on the list of attendees? Oh, someone is raising their hand. Oh, Don is. Hi, Don. Do you need? Ah, uh, yes, uh, Ron's attempting to join right now. I'm texting with him, he'll, he'll join shortly. Oh, sure, okay. We'll give him a minute. I'm gonna put your hand down unless you have anything else. No, nothing else then. Okay, great. Well, why don't we at least um, have Scott and Don, if you just want to introduce yourselves for the record, and then when, when Ron joins, he can do the same. Sure, my name is Scott Turner. Uh, my position is Director of Planning with Environmental Partners in Quincy. Um, I'm a registered professional engineer and a certified planner. Okay, great. And Don? Yes, I'm Don Flaherty. I'm with Seed Associates. I'm the Director of Operational Health Physics. I'm a certified health physicist with the American Board of Health Physics. Okay, great. Um, is Ron? So I, oh, I do see a new number has joined ending in 843. Is that Ron? I believe you can use um, star nine to raise your hand and I can move you over. Hmm, maybe not. All right, wait, is Ron covering traffic? Is that his role? No, um, Ron is, is with CN Associates. Oh, okay. All right. Well, why don't we get started on the other components of it while he's trying to join and assuming, Jim, if you can just keep an eye out for him, um, he can join us. Um, so I don't think there's been any new information submitted since we last met. That's correct. Okay. Do board members have any questions regarding the um, review submitted on that portion of the site plan? Carrie, I think the noise study was submitted to us. Did everyone get a copy of that? Yes, is, but you don't have the noise person here, correct? No, no we didn't. We, okay. as a town, we didn't hire a, a noise peer reviewer or an acoustic peer reviewer. Oh, right, but the firm who did it. I don't think there's a representative here from that firm. That's okay if there's not. Yeah, that, we'll have to ask Mike Corelli from Steris about that. Okay, sure. All right, did you have questions about noise, Michelle? Uh, no, you just said at the last meeting they hadn't provided the noise study to the planning board, and now they have provided. I just want to make you sure that everyone received it. Oh, good, okay. Did everyone receive the acoustic study that came? Okay, sounds good. Um, all right, I do have some questions. I don't know if we're still waiting for Ron, but just in terms of the plan itself, and I'm not sure if you have the answers or not. Um, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of things in looking at um, the, and I, I realize you didn't necessarily view the concrete plant, but I'm just wondering if um, any sort of calculations change in your mind. For example, one thing I was questioning was just the lot coverage had increased 36%, which is still within the 40% allowance, but I wasn't sure with the concrete plant. Was that just built? That looks like it's right on the parking lot, so no additional change there. Is that true? That's how I interpreted it, yes. Okay. Okay, and then actually, why don't I pull up, let's see. I also just moved Ron over as a panelist. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, this slide. Okay, so this, I think, did we, we receive this? 
I think just this week. So in looking at it, it does look to you like it's right on the on the same area as the parking lot in general. Yes, that's how, yes. Okay. Um, so my questions were, does they, with the location of the concrete plant here, does that change anything or impact any sort of plans on the current groundwater plan, whether it's you know, any sort of drainage structures or things like that um, with the drainage easement back here? Is there anything that's impacted by the plant being in this area over here? No, I mean, typically when we review plans and projects, we review them for the as-built condition or, or the proposed condition. And the assumption when you do peer review is that any kind of construction impacts are mitigated through the construction process. So th there isn't really a, you know, in all my years I've been working, I haven't either as an applicant or a reviewer have not provided any kind of interim analysis for a construction impact. The construction impacts are typically managed through um, the construction process and dictated by the stormwater pollution prevention plan. Okay. Well, I'm just wondering, since this is going to be here for 12 to 18 months, is there anything that needs to be built in this area, like any sort of, um, what did I say, any sort of drainage structures that would be built over here that wouldn't be, you couldn't access because there's going to be a concrete plant sitting here for the duration of 12 to 18 months, I guess. So that's a that's really a, a question for the applicant and their, constructor, uh, their construction company. Typically what happens is all of the site utilities that they're proposing, including the stormwater management would be installed first. And, um, you know, then they would all be protected by, you know, silt sacks in the catch basins or perhaps silt, um, silt fence or, or hay bales to, to prevent any type of siltation from entering the catch basins and, and you know, impacting the drainage system um, as part of the stormwater pollution prevention plan, which is typically provided prior to construction. So after entitlements are received, but prior to construction, um, that will typically outline a, a, any kind of um, uh, dewatering um, facilities if they're needed or any kind of temporary sedimentation basin. I mean, the way construction works is that, you know, it's always changing. So the, the stormwater pollution prevention plan is a requirement from EPA that requires the contractor to construct what's necessary to build, you know, temporary erosion and sedimentation um, structures where needed. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'll, I can always ask. Um, I just didn't know if that was something you knew, if there's any sort of um, drainage structures over here, but maybe that's not it, known. It, or well, there are drainage structures. I mean, there's a drain line that's proposed. If you look at the site plans, there's, there's a drain line that's proposed through there. There are some catch basins. And what I would expect, although you, you want to confirm it for the applicant, is that all of those would be installed first. And then, you know, the catch basins would be protected so that erosion and sedimentation does not get into them. Okay. Okay, great. Any other questions from board members? I can't see everybody, so just to give a yell. No, okay. Oh, Millie, are you asking a question or are you just looking? Are these questions also, are we looking at the concrete plant, the information that we got this week? Oh, well, um, I think when we bring everybody on, we can ask questions. I don't think the peer reviewer looked at the concrete plant. I was just curious okay. about, um, as it relates to what was proposed in the okay. site plan, if the, if the concrete plant in its current position would prevent or limit any part of the proposed plan. Okay. All right. And it sounds like, Scott, what you're saying is that usually all of that would be built out first so that there would be no impact of those this structure here for that period of time. Right, provided they follow the SWIP, the, the stormwater pollution prevention plan. And the requirements regarding that are, you know, 
Oops, you muted. Could anyone hear Scott? I couldn't hear him for a minute. No, I think he froze. He's froze. Oh. Yeah. That's worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on a weekly basis or after significant rainfall. So typically what'll happen typically what will happen is a um, you know, someone will go out and inspect erosion controls to make sure that they're intact. We'll will inspect, you know, whatever type of um, protection they have around catch basins and so forth um, to make sure that everything's intact. If they see something that does not seem right, if they see, you know, significant, significant amounts of dust, if they see um, tiltation devices that have failed, if they see structures in or, you know, erosion control structures prevent that are supposed to protect the catch basins, not doing their job, that will be um, captured in the um, in the inspection, given to the contractor, and it's the contractor's responsibility to fix it. Okay, we missed the very first part of your what you were saying because you froze and cut out. So you oh, just started, those requirements are, and we missed that very like first couple of sentences. Okay, so the requirements are that they that the, the document is on site. It's maintained by the contractor. It is, um, there are inspections that occur every week. They have to be documented. Um, the, the inspect, or after a heavy rainfall. So if you have a rainfall of half an inch or more, they need to do an inspection. If they see that the erosion sedimentation controls have failed, if they see that um, there's an erosion condition or a dust condition or, you know, sediment is being tracked off site, anything like that, it's reported. It's documented, it's reported to the contractor and the contract, it's the contractor's responsibility to fix those, um, fix whatever deficiencies they see. Okay. And so one thing that if you are inclined to issue an approval, one of the things I would recommend is that you have a, you receive copies of those SWIP inspections. Someone at town hall receive copies of them so that they know that they're being done. Okay, great. Any other questions from board members? I don't see any. Okay, I'd like to, um, why don't we move on to, let's see, we have uh, any additional radiation um, peer review questions. So I'm going to pull that up. Give me a minute. Okay, do board members have questions, any questions to start for the, any additional questions? I know that you answered questions last time, but if there are any additional questions by members um, regarding the radiation review. As, as far as the just general radiation itself? Any questions that the peer reviewer can answer about um, what any of the materials he submitted or in answering the questions, things like that. Oh, okay, I do not. Okay, any questions? This is a quick question. Um, and I first, again, I didn't see it in the document, but um, how much energy or amps, watts to these uh, electron accelerators to use when, when activated? Oh, Don, you're on mute. And Ron, you're on mute too. I'm gonna to unmute you so that you can answer the question. Amperage, I can't say. Uh, Steris can answer, you know, how many amps of electricity it draws. Uh, the rating of the unit is, uh, seven and a half megawatts, but that doesn't tell you the amperage of the current. That's just the energy that's imparted in the electron to hit the target and generate the x-rays. Okay, thanks. Hope that helps. Yeah, so, so Ditto, we're, we're experts on dose. 
and um, you know measuring dose rates. These um, this equipment, these machines, the, you know whatever they do is one thing. It's what they generate is where we come in as far as the safety and what you need to do to protect people from it and what its effects are on people at different dose rates. So, so I concur with what Don said. Understood, thank you. You know, one thing I wanted to say, I didn't say it last week is, it is true that the dose to children, children are much more susceptible to damage from radiation. But if the dose can't get to the, to the children, then it's a moot point. And, um, you know, when you have tiny amounts of dose at the outside wall, if somebody's down the street, it's a true fact that they would be more sensitive, but there's, there's no radiation, you know, hitting them. And, and we truly are neutral here. Um, I didn't get the chance to say it, but uh, I, I don't know if that was that important. But anyways, I just wanted to get that out. No, thanks for sharing that. Additional questions from board members? Um, I actually have a question on the machinery itself, that it has a converter material, is that correct? Which is a, a high density element, usually is that like a heavy metal? You mean the target, the target material that the uh, electron beam hits to generate the x-rays? Yeah. Yes. I don't think it's, I, I recall what it was, or I mean, I recall reading what it was, but I don't remember the exact element, but it's not like when you think of heavy metal, like lead or something like that. No, it's not. I think uh, it was. Yeah, go ahead. I think it was something that started with a T, palladium. Usually it's maybe tungsten. Um, that's usually what targets are. Was it that? I haven't seen it. But. Uh, I honestly, I didn't write it down, but um, it was on the, uh, I thought it was like palladium or something like that. Yeah. I was just, I was curious as to really what that was. Yeah. I remember reading, I just forget which element I could look it up, maybe even while the meeting's going on, but it's it's an element that particularly is effective at generating the x-rays. That's why they choose it. And okay. uh, it's not lead, it's not, you know, mercury, it's it's not uh, a lot of the, you know, heavy metals that you think of, but it, it is a metal. Does, and, and what happens when, does that get used up? Does it get replaced? Is it something that has to be handled carefully? No, no, no. No, I mean, think of it like steel, even though it's not. It, it's, it's metal that when the electron beam hits it, all of the electron itself is absorbed totally. But in the process of absorbing the energy, because the electron has got a lot of kinetic energy, that's because you have that voltage, you know, accelerating that electron from the cathode to the anode, which is this target. And when it interacts with the target, the, the uh, electron basically is dissipated, it's completely stopped. But in the process, all that energy is converted to X-rays, and, and, and that's that's the point. Emily, you're you're wondering, does the, the target get uh, depleted, and do you need to replace a target? I mean, maybe in many many years, but I, I don't recall that them having to replace it because they get depleted. You either done? No, I don't recall that being an issue at all. No. Yeah. But if it is, it's just it's just metal. It's okay, so it doesn't need any special type of handling, or it doesn't convert into any other type of material to be worried about? No, I don't see that at all. I didn't see that in any, any of the research that I did, no, no. Okay. Did you have another question, Millie? Um, the, going back to the, um, when you do an actual dose that gets measured uh, at startup, for uh, checking the operation, does it does it get measured again at other times, or is that just set as a certain dose for um, the regulatory limits? Well, that would be up to the Commonwealth to decide if they wanted regular, you know, surveys. Certainly, they have. They it's in the regulations now that says when you construct it and start it up, you have to have that shield survey to show that the shield is effective. I think in our last meeting, <clears throat> Steris, uh, I believe they stated that they would do uh, an annual, you know, 
confirmation of it. And then they also spoke that obviously if they had any kind of catastrophic event that made them think that the shield was compromised in any way that they would repeat it, which would okay. be approved. So it's basically if the state or the um, facility determines it's needed. That's what I recall. Uh, no. Okay. I couldn't remember that. Um, and as far as the, um, the uh, description of training requirements for operators, they get a whole list of things for the emergency procedures. Is that something that the town would also get a copy of? Or we could? Well, I can't speak for Steris or the state. Uh, okay. You know, I, I don't know why not, but that's, you know, that's, that would be a question for them to answer. Okay. So, so typically emergency procedures are really important when you're dealing with radioactive material. In this case, one of the pluses for safety is when the power stops, the radiation stops. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure what would even, you know, qualify as an emergency. Maybe they couldn't shut the machine off or something, but somebody can just go hit the breakers. Where we really run into these issues and they're important and significant is when there's radioactive material. Right. And just continually uh, emitting radiation and gets uh, out of control. So, so here I don't see where there'd be a concern with that from a radiation standpoint, because you, ki you kill the juice and you kill the radiation. And Millie, I looked at my references and, you know, what are considered favorable targets for the electron beam to generate the electrons are tungsten. Yeah. I think Ron mentioned that. Yeah. Tantalum, T-A-N-T-A-L-U-M. That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah, and that might have been that. Okay. The other one is gold. I don't think they're using gold. <laughs> <laughs> I need to inspect the site then. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, that's it for me at this time. Okay. Other questions from board members? Not for me. Okay. Um, I have a few additional questions. I'm just going to share the report. Okay, so um, one thing that we had talked about throughout the hearings is really thinking about what kind of shutoff system there is. So if, it, if it's automatic or manual, um, oops, am I looking at the wrong page? Oh, no, it's at the bottom of this page. Okay, so just looking at like, like any sort of ability to shut this off. You said, you know, somebody could just hit the button or whatever the case, but um, there wasn't a whole lot more about that. And I was just wondering, you said that you haven't reviewed the design and operations material, so you can't really comment on it. But in general, is it, does it rely on the operator? And if it sounded like if the operator is incapacitated, the system will automatically shut down. But how much time passes? How does this, how does the system know the operator is incapacitated, I guess? That wasn't clear to me how that works. I, and I know you, I realize your answer here suggests that you can't really comment on this specifically, but what does it, is there a general way that works? Well, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this. The, the system could just keep operating and no one's harmed, right? In other words, you could operate this system 24 seven and the shielding takes care of all keeping the x-rays you know, in the facility. So even if the operator is incapacitated, it's not like there's a problem. If, if the, uh, and there's more than one operator there. I think they, one of the papers said they have multiple people there. You know, they, they're never just one person there, I think. Uh, so, and then they describe that they have different interlocks and, and automatic shutoff things. I think this may, and now I'm, I'm starting to conjecture here because I haven't seen the documents, but, you know, if the, if some part of the system was failing such that it might, you know, damage the electronics or do something like that, that would make the system, you know, not function, to do its job, it would shut itself off. I think that's the kind of controls <clears throat> that are built. Um, it's not like it's, uh, 
there's a high radiation level outside and we have to shut it off or something like that. It's not like that. It's more, I think it's more protecting the equipment because that's the, that's yeah. probably the real things, but they haven't, they've talked about in their documents that were submitted multiple ways that the system automatically shuts itself off, but they didn't provide the specifics. So, so the, the, the downside here is that is damage to the equipment. Yeah. Um, so, but, but as far as humans getting in front of the beams, there are interlocks that the state, you know, wouldn't allow them to operate this equipment if they didn't have those interlocks. Um, and I mean, I don't even know, Don, you've looked at this more clearly to me. Do they, is this all automated or do they go in and place things in and then come out and then turn the beam on? Um, now we're not talking about the public, right? We're talking about their employees. Right. About the workers, yeah. They have a conveyor belt system where they run things. But, you know, it's like any kind of system. You have to shut it off and go inside and do maintenance inspections and that type of thing. You know, uh, you know, if the, you know, they have two linear accelerators and if one of them wasn't working to capacity, they might shut the system down and go remove it and replace it you know, with another one of the like kind or something like that. So they would have to, at times, go inside the area where the medical uh, supplies or equipment's, you know, being irradiated to sterilize it. And so obviously you can't have the system operating right. for people to go in there. And I believe they have, you know, automatic things to where unless the system's shut off and you open a door or some hatchway or to go inside, it's going to shut itself off. But that's to protect the worker, not the public. And the state would be really oh. focused very, you know, they're going to be all over that, right? They're never going to license yeah. this thing right. unless there's interlocks that nobody could go in and get hit with the beam. Right. Yeah, those like are embedded in the regulations quite strongly yeah. to protect the workers inside the facility because they're the only ones that could have access to these high radiation levels because it's inside the shield that that happens. Okay. And so when it comes down to the um, what the state looks at, they, you've listed here all the things that they have to do. So they, they actually register as a radiation machine facility? Yes. Okay. Now this is, uh, the, this accelerator to do these x-rays is, falls under the definition of a radiation machine, like we've used the analogy before in our, our meetings. It's like the radiation machine in your dentist's office or at the hospital when they do a chest x-ray. Those are radiation machines. These are all radiation machines. Mm -hmm. They have different function, different types, but that's all what they do. So they all fall under. So the application that Steris will be submitting, assuming they get approval to move forward, has to provide all this information to the Commonwealth uh, Race Control you know, Bureau uh, to say, this is the design, this is how it works, these are the interlocks, here's all this information, here's the people that are going to be operating it, this is their training, these are their qualifications, here's the radiation safety officer, all, all of the stuff before the Commonwealth will even entertain giving them, uh, or, or, you know, to register the device and authorize them to, to purchase it and put it on, on the product. Yeah. And, and so the, the radiation control group is concerned about employees, but they're just as much, if not more, concerned with members of the public. Mm -hmm. And if they think that they, they go apoplectic, if they think that, the, you know, so you have another buffer here, which is that, because um, the state would be liable um, if they license this and members of the public get, get exposed. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, every, you know, everything I've seen doesn't show any, any, any of that. Um, okay. So um, the electron beam is the same thing as a particle accelerator. So this is a particle accelerator. Yes, as now that sounds a little scary. It's a particle <laughs> accelerator, but so is uh, the old TVs that were cathode ray tubes. Yep. So okay. No, that's okay. I just want to verify. So then yes. they they follow the safety requirements of particle accelerators and they register as a radiation machine facility. Exactly. Got it. Okay. Um, let's see. Are you available for part time work? You're starting to get this, Kerry. We may have a job for. <laughs> <laughs> this is right up my alley. I, well, yeah. All right. Let's see. I had a question about the concrete. Um, and it sounded like, 
you know, one thing we had talked about with the concrete is we had heard at one of the hearings that, you know, the concrete walls are ba basically consider it like the lead vests, like you brought up the den dentist analogy. So the concrete walls are the lead vest that protects the public from the radiation getting out. So one of the board concerns over time has been, um, what happens if there's a crack? What ha does this, does the concrete degrade over time? What if there's some sort of earthquake, whatever the case? And I, you know, I, what's the life expectancy? Does this concrete last forever? I mean, I know in my own garage, I see cracks and it looks like it crumbles and all of that. So I know you said here that you're not an expert concerning life expectancy, but you don't anticipate it would degrade or. So I'll take a quick shot at it and then I'll let Dawn respond to it. So like nuclear power plants have concrete walls mm -hmm. and uh, they don't, you know, degrade over time because of the radiation. I think that, you know, if concrete itself ages and cracks to the point where there is like light that can be seen through it, then part of that beam could get out. Um, but I would imagine that that's highly, um, you know, unlikely. But Don, uh, maybe you can <coughs> do concrete, concrete containment at the new plants. And, right. you know, does that have, does that get degraded because of the radiation or? No, not from the radiation. It would have to be, you know, uh, stressed by, you know, chemicals or a, a, an environment that attacks the concrete, such as, you know, acids or caustic okay. solutions or. Well, I'm not even I'm not even sure the concern was that it would be radiation to degrade it. Just general life expectancy. Yeah. I, I didn't assume that to be, live forever, and so that's why it said there was no degradation of concrete over time. There's no limitation on the life expectancy. It just seemed like how could that be? But okay, that's okay. Well, I know I, you're not concrete experts. Yeah, but I no. but I agree. I mean, the concrete's not going to last forever, right? <laughs> Um, and in time, it, it probably could uh, degrade many years down the road. And then um, that could become an issue if that starts to degrade. But yeah, we wouldn't know about when. Okay. And just to confirm a couple of things that you didn't have any comments on, I just want to make sure. And so no, I re it's probably not your area of expertise. No real comment on the chillers. Um, no comment on the power grid. But I did want to ask... Um, in regards to the process that requires high, it, it seems to require high voltage at some point. There's an excessive amount of electricity. Um, is that is that going on and off that high voltage surge? Like if they're turning this on and off or does it run, does it stay on the whole day or how does that look for turning? I'm just wondering with a high voltage surge going on and off, if, what kind of impact that has? Um. Again, again, I can't say exactly because of their, their power requirements. Understand that when we say watts or megawatts, you know, the formula for a watt is voltage times amps. So if you have a very high potential voltage between two spots, then the, you know, the amperage can be lower, but the wattage is higher because, you know, the voltage is high, but the actual number of amps it's pulling off of the gr local grid could be smaller. So I think I recall Steris stating that they didn't have really any big special needs. As far as how it's on and off, as I understood their description of their operation, they would be doing, uh, it would be on and off in the sense that uh, they set up the machine, you know, it's a maximum of seven and a half megawatts power to the, uh, you know, for that accelerator but they may not need all of that. They may operate it less than that. And for a given thing that they want to irradiate to sterilize, they can say, oh, well, we'll run it at this power level, at this speed on our conveyor belt and, and irradiate it for this amount of time with the x-rays. And then that will get done with those widgets, whatever those things are. Then we'll load our conveyor belts with this, these other items and operate it that way. So I would think, and they can speak better to it, that there will be times when it's running and then there'll be times when it's off in between doing batches of various products. You know, but uh, I think they, they answered one question saying that basically they plan in general to run it 24 seven. Obviously mm -hmm. it's more profitable for them to run that as much as they can 
to charge their customers for sterilizing, uh, uh, you know, to state the obvious, to sterilize components. So, but it, I think when they do in batches of different things, it's going to be on for a while and it'll be off for a while and then back on again. You know, what that would do to the local grid, I, I can't speak to. Okay. Okay, and then um, no, it was said at one point that the carbon dioxide, uh, there'd be some level of, um, it would be emitting carbon dioxide with the large use of electricity, but it sounds like in the answers here, it says that it would not, um, and you have no comment on it either way. I guess generally, would this large use of electricity emit carbon dioxide emissions or not necessarily? I or you would don't not. have the expertise. I, I don't have the expertise for that. That's okay. All right. Let's see. Now, um, when we talk about a device that you could put on the outside of the building, there is such a device to monitor outside? <clears throat> yes. Several. Yeah, a number of them. Okay, so hold that thought because then there's a follow-up question to that in a bit. Um, all right, let's see. And Terry, typically they would put a passive thermal luminescent disseminator, meaning a, a little badge like somebody would wear as an X-ray tech. And it, and it just records the total dose over <clears throat> time when you don't expect it to be that high. There are other more sophisticated instruments that we use in environments where we're scared that something could happen real time. And those are real time monitors that are reading every second and reporting and they're alarmed. Um, I would think that would be overkill here. Um, you know, don't say I recommended it because they'll they'll shoot me. I mean, somebody could do that for reassurance. It's not what the regulator is going to make them do, and it's not what is typically done. But you, th there are those types of continuous monitors that you know that you could put out there as kind of a canary. But I, I just don't see that it would ever get engaged. It would be more like just something to give people peace of mind as opposed to really identifying anything. Okay, um, I'm just finding my place here. The question for here would be, let's see. So there was no comment down here. So that does that just mean that there is no inquiry into the other location? They're just looking for a high level inquiry, but there's nothing really here in terms of what exists. Oh, it was Ontario, California and the Illinois office, Libertyville. So there sounds like nothing that those are the only two other locations that we were aware of. Um, but no information there, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, hold on, I'll stop. So I don't. And then the, the Switzerland. Uh, so we had, you know, part of our discussions had been uh, concerned that this was coming to the US in these three locations. So this had only been operating in, at the time we started the Switzerland facility, or it was given to us as an example. Um, I guess there's another, the Venlo, the Netherlands, Switzerland. Um, so we were curious, you know, to see how they were operating um, internationally, because in the US, there was only, we only knew of Northboro, Ontario, California, and Libertyville. Um, but it looks like overall, you had no real comments or any information on the anything going on internationally. And if there are any problems or um, anything that would help inform us on what that would look like in the US based on how it's operating abroad? No, we didn't have the specifics of that. Too inform informant work. Okay, that's okay. Um, alrighty, almost I'm down to the bottom of my questions. So um, I didn't know if this was a mistake. So the question was how many x-ray sterilizers will there be? And maybe you just thought, so there was no answer, but the response was consistent with the literature. So I wasn't sure like, do you remember what the literature was here, the answer? Because we don't have the answer that you found consistent. 
uh, how many sterile? This is the question. How many sterilizer machines will there be in Northboro? Yeah. Yeah, two. I think they said they their literature said they would have two accelerators, so they could have them basically on opposite sides of a conveyor belt, so that they could uh, sterilize from both sides of a packaged, you know, so a package. Okay, so again, back to if there's a problem, um, any sort of, uh, now this is related to the chillers. It sounds to me like the chillers are needed so to keep the heat down, um, you didn't really have it. That's not your area of expertise anyway, so that's okay, but just no information on if there's an alarm or anything like that. Correct, yeah, I, that wasn't our area of expertise, so we didn't pursue it. That's okay, and then so um, no information on like an, an emergency shutdown um, you just didn't have the technical design information, so that's okay. Yeah, they just made statements that they had multiple automatic shutdowns for various reasons, but they didn't specify what. Okay, so they exist, but we don't know what they are. Um, okay, this, this made sense to me, and now with your answer, it makes more sense. So there is no residual rad radiation. It sounded like, Ron, what you were saying is once it shuts off, the radiation is no longer there. So... The, the answer was just no, the machine creates no radio, radioactive contamination, but we are, I think the question was about radiation. So mm -hmm. you still agree that, that there is no residual radiation? Yeah. Once, the machine, yeah. Once the machine's off, the, that's the end oh. of the radiation. Right. Okay. Which is, as we said before, that's part of the reason for the power level chosen. You know, you can, you can have later accelerators that are much higher power level than this one that they've selected that can create radioactive material and do for, for intentional reasons. This is not one of them, so it's not able to. Okay, so this is why I was confused because there are things that measure radiation outside the facility, but then it seemed like we, there wasn't, we don't, now we don't know of one and there's not a need or requirement to install it. So are, are we talking about two different, um, components or is this still, is it, when we say something to measure the radiation outside the facility, it does exist, but we're not gonna use it or how does that coincide, how does that? What I'm saying is there are certainly devices that measure radiation in this way, x-rays in the environment mm -hmm. they exist. Uh, uh, we, you know, we're saying yes, they do exist, uh, but we would agree they're not needed Okay. Uh, assuming the shield performance is as designed, there would be there would be no need. You know what Ron Carterelli mentioned earlier is, you know, uh, the radiation level would be basically you wouldn't get a response for the instrument unless the entire shielding starts opening up and you know that type of thing. So, but they do exist. Uh, you know these these types of devices do exist to measure radiation levels in in the environment. So the state may ask them to put a environmental dissimilar on the outside of the wall, um, just to prove that they're not going to be greater than what the public dose yeah. limit is. Yeah. The, when Ron's saying an environmental dissimilar, what he's saying is when you're trying to measure, carry really, really, really low levels of radiation, uh, a device that's measuring the instantaneous dose rate can't see it. It's just so low. It's it's just in the background, pretty much, uh, whether it's electronic noise in the instrument or just the natural background radioactivity in Northboro, which can be measured. It exists mm -hmm. from radon and cosmic rays and all that. That all exists. So you can measure that and to try to see some very small difference between that natural background radiation and something that might be coming from this facility. Instantaneous dose rate is very difficult at such low levels. And so in those cases, sometimes facilities put, you know, whether it's a optically stimulator or thermoluminescent dosimeter, but there's a special device that collects and integrates that energy over time. And then you process that chip and say, hey, what was the radiation level, you know, for this entire quarter or month or whatever? And it can integrate really small amounts of radiation exposure, tiny, tiny ones over a period of time and give you a number. And, you know, the, that exists, but it's not like an instantaneous readout with alarms or whatever. It's not what it is. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. So you, if it's a low level constant radiation, it may not even prompt the monitor to think there's something going on because it doesn't even reach that level. It's just a constant low level. 
Yeah, it, it's just it's lost in the noise of background because it's so low level. If it exists, I'm, I'm not saying it will exist, but if it were to exist, it, you know, uh, by this design, if you could put these on the perimeter of the property, and they would be probably measuring just normal background radiation that they would anywhere else, like today before the facility goes there, because there is measurable background radiation levels, okay, yeah. uh, in Northboro right now from terrestrial radiation from the rocks and from cosmic radiation from outer space and from radon gas coming out of the ground. And we can we can take instruments and measure it. It's probably in the range of five to 10 microrim per hour. That's, that, that's the natural. The real, -time, the real time instruments that I'm talking about, Kerry, they just for this kind of reassurance, we don't think they would see anything. They would only be able to see something if it really was strong, but it may give people reassurance that if those things aren't going off, then just as we had thought, nothing's coming out of the wall. Mm -hmm. But the state will not, I believe the state will not make them do that because mm -hmm. the shield wall is so thick and the dose rate is tiny on the other side. It would just be an extra bell and whistle that somebody may want to give to folks that don't understand radiation to make them feel better, but it would never be regulatorily driven. Okay, and just speaking of the dose, so 7.5 MEVs or whatever is the maximum this machine can go. Even if you wanted to crank it up, you cannot crank it up. Correct. Can it go up to 10? No. <laughs> no, it's not, yeah, it's not designed to do it. All right, I just want to make sure because it seems like some, in some cases it can go up. There are machines that go up like to a 7.5 to 10 or something. So I just wasn't well, sure. Was yeah, the linear accelerator is, is made differently from the beginning in order to do that, yes. Okay. And then I know you didn't have any comments on um, just EMF. So is that because that's not in your area of expertise, just in terms of like, you know, I guess any sort of electrical interference that you foresee, like whether it's with, you know, wireless, phones, TV, medical devices, anything like that that could possibly be generated? That's not in our expertise, Carrie. Okay, that's okay. And you mentioned the, so the gas emitted, it creates ozone. Um, but does that something that, wh where does that, is that created inside? And is there like a vent that gets rid of it? I don't know what, what happened. Oh, I guess you have no comment regarding ozone emissions. So you just recognize they, you don't have area of expertise there? Right, I mean, ozone is, is created when you have a, a lot of radiation and there's air. <laughs> so, you know, think of, think of, Probably not a great analogy, but when lightning strikes, it creates ozone in the air because it's 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 ionizing the air. And so these X-rays, besides ionizing the you know germs in these medical products to sterilize them, can ionize the air, so it creates some ozone. And they state that, but we're not experts on ozone emissions. I don't know how much ozone it emits and what they do with it. So. So I imagine, I mean, I wouldn't, I, don't, I wouldn't want anyone to breathe it in, employees or otherwise, it seems like that would be harmful, but okay. Um, all right, so any sort of electromagnetic. I want to go back to that outside radiation monitor. I, I said it last meeting, but this is, this is really important. Sure. If you guys went that way or stairs went that way or, I don't, like Ron said, a state, I don't think would require because they just wouldn't think it was necessary, you know. These have to be quality instruments that have, you know, if you're going to put something in the environment to measure radiation levels and you're measuring them down really into bug dust, you know, to right around background levels, you know, voltage fluctuations, weather intrusion into the device shorting things out, they create false alarms and scare people. And so, I'm not saying it's certainly up to other people to decide whether or not, you know, this is going to be a requirement or would be warranted, but our recommendation would be if anyone goes that way, you get really quality instruments for that. Okay. Cause nuclear plants deal with this and I've got several decades with them and uh, third party people want those. And then they're, they're not high quality. Sometimes they're not high quality machines. They're not hooked up to, a power conditioner, and next thing you know, it's like, oh, it's alarming here. Something's going on at the nuclear plant, and absolutely nothing's going on at the nuclear plant. 
and it frightens people and it's just not meeting the design. And so that, that's just my comment. On this. Okay, so is there any sort of assurance or is there any tool or way that we would be able to assure the neighbors and whoever else that there is no radiation escaping? I, I guess the way I would, I, I gave this some thought because I, I read some of the comments that were sent in. I've not read some of them. I read the comments that were emailed in. Um, what, and I'm not a proponent of this. I don't, you know, we're, we're neutral and this was Ron said, but you know, this, this machine is inherently safe in that it doesn't take anything to stop the x-rays that are used to sterilize these medical uh, components other than the concrete that's there. It, do, it doesn't take electricity to stop it. It doesn't take people to stop it. It doesn't take anything other than if they design that shielding as, as designed and the Commonwealth approves it and they do the shielding surveys, then it becomes inherently safe. And so um, I, I think if, if I'm answering where, where you're headed with that. Well, so I know you say it's inherently safe and certainly I'm not saying that you're not, you're, that's not true. I'm just wondering, like, if, if we were to want some sense of um, security that that is all, you know, is it contingent? If we have to rely on reporting, you know, what are our tools that we have to rely on? Is it reporting? Is that the tool that helps us like monitor? Or what are those safeguards, if not a monitoring device? Yeah. Is it reporting? Is it uh, inspections? Like, what are those things? Harry, can I ask a question? Please do, sure. Okay. So at the last meeting, we talked about having a device outside the building, which would have an alarm, which after your discussion now, you might say, you know, Michelle might never go off, right? Because there would not be enough radiation in your um, opinion to trigger it. But then you could have the questions were, um, how do you determine the integrity of the concrete over time? You know, how do you know, is it five years, is it 10, is it 15, how do you, and if something happens, how do you know that integrity of the concrete is okay where there's nothing, even small amounts being released? And so then we talked about this environmental disseminator, which doesn't really give you that real time, like alarm going off and you know there's a problem. But as you said, it's more like data over 30 days or so where you can look back on the data and then you can say, okay, under normal conditions, I'm assuming you're starting with the base point, under normal conditions, your data shows this, but we saw increments increase over the past 30 days. Was that because a weather, weather happened or another element that could be explained or actually is there something wrong with the shield that you're talking about? So I see it twofold. I see there is we did talk um, because we had many residents come and ask about how we could get this peace of mind about something that was alarmed, that was enclosed, that could not be touched or tampered with outside that, as you said, maybe may never ever go away, maybe never go off, but it's a peace of mind equipment that's out there. And then after today, I think I like the idea of the environmental disseminator because what it does is it shows over time you know, what you're talking about is if there is a possible leak that's happening, it's gonna show you, even if it's subtle and small enough, it's gonna show you the data over 30 days, 60 and 90 days. Is that correct? Those are two forms of sort of protection, exterior protection. Whether or not they ever happen, that's two forms for consideration. So, so if it was me and I was a doubt in Thomas, cause I wasn't an expert on it, um, the very cheap, simple way to do it is to put these outside decimeters somewhere um, and look at the dose compared to natural background every 30 days. And then you'll, you'll know for sure. Um, the, the idea of also putting out there um, a dose rate meter, which is looking at what the dose rate is typically, let's say five microns per hour, and has some kind of an alarm, so long as it's not set at some number that it could go off just from natural uh, perturbations in the environment and freak everybody out. Um, if you put it at a sensible alarm, that, that would really be overkill. Um, but 
you know, I'm not sure if this thing has taken a long time, then, you know, the vendor may be more than happy to put that in <coughs> to say, okay. But, you know, as a scientist in this area, if it was me and I didn't know anything about it and it was a new technology, I, I would be happy with the dissimilar and I would just want to check that once a month to see. And there, and I, they, that would tell you a lot and it's not that expensive. And people do do this and they do use it. Um, and they don't expect any doses, but it's just a reassurance. They put them at the boundaries of the property. Um, they're environmental disseminators. A lot of times the state would do that when there's emissions that do come off. In your case, there's nothing really, but they do put them at the fence line and then the, the state comes and checks them and makes sure. Here, I don't think the state will ask, but you folks could do it. And you could put it a lot closer to the building. Um, it's not that expensive and it'll probably give some peace of mind. I just have one more question. Um, you talked about, or I think it was Ron was talking about quality versus on these um, environmental disseminators. I mean, if the town staff doesn't know or we don't, we're on experts, like how do you determine what is a quality product versus something that's not as good so that you get the accurate readings? So, so there are a few national companies that, um, you know, sell these decimeters, collect them and read them. Um, and they're um, nationally accredited because in most cases they're being used for people's doses. Um, so they are highly regulated and uh, Landau is one of them. Um, <clears throat> maybe another one, there's only a few and they would, um, you know, send you the disseminators, you'd place them where you want and somebody would take them off once a month or once a quarter, whatever you want and send them in. So they just send you new ones and you just keep, keep doing it and you get a report and, mm -hmm. and it says it. And for those types of disseminators, as long as you're with one of those good companies, one's as good as the other. Um, you know, when it comes to instruments, now you're talking more money and you, there's more variety. You'd, um, you know, at that point, you're not gonna call one of your company and just say, set this up. Then you would need some kind of a consultant to advise you and recommend the instruments and make sure they're set up. And, and so that's a lot more involved. I don't think that's called for here. I think your simplest way is with the decimators with some of these major companies in the US. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you have another question, Michelle? Okay. I'm good. Sure, okay. Um, so then um, just previous to Michelle asking your questions, I just asked, you know, if not these kind of alarm systems because it, may or may not be a false sense of security, um, just what other tools do we have to rely on and whether or not it's reporting or inspections or what are those um, safeguards or what are the tools in place that we can count on to continuously, it does it rely on reporting and inspections and all of that? Like ensuring continual safety, what are those tools for us? Do you want to take a crack? I mean, the state's going to be the ones that are going to right. be your, um, this right. one I mean, is above the, regulatory space. Go ahead, Don. I mean, the client has their procedures they're going to follow, which, by the way, the, the Commonwealth is going to approve them to even have the device based on them showing their procedures, that they're quality, et cetera. It's, they just don't hand these out. So the, um, so the, 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 the applicant will have procedures that require them to operate a certain way and to document certain things and to perform radiation surveys before they go inside the shield. That's really for worker protection, not for public protection. Um, and then, you know, when they do these, they create documents and you said not reporting, but those, those documents are created, whether reported or not, those are there. Uh, so, you know, those could be, I assume those could be made available for you to, you know, to look at, uh, to, to, to see, or to have someone else third party look at. Am okay. I answering the question, Carrie? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I just wanna know like, what could, you know, we, what comes to the town that we could see? So it sounds like the Department of Public Health is responsible for enforcement. So it's not something the town really does. Um, they have rules, purpose and scope for radiation machine facilities. 
uh, different requirements, applicable provisions. So I, I don't know, maybe you put a list of reports. Oh, okay, let's see. So these are some, these, this is all, these are all things that you pulled in from the Massachusetts, um, from us, from Massachusetts, whatever it would be, regulations or, yes. okay. Oh, so this wasn't your summary of it. This is like, this is literally what was, what's there. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, part of what I did is I went and looked at the Commonwealth's regulations for controlling radiation machines or, you know, radiation levels, et cetera. And specifically like particles accelerators, the radiation machines, they control them what the requirements are. There's a plan review. They review the installation. They do all that. There's a lot. There's a lot of oversight by the Commonwealth. And, and it's public information, right, Don, once they do their inspections and- I, um, I, I, Yeah, I really think that's all. I mean, you may have to ask for it. They may not automatically just hand it to the town of Northboro, but uh, I, I can't imagine them refusing to give you that information and you can engage them for that. And, have them explain it to you, et cetera. Does, does the town, would the town be alerted if reports weren't provided? Or not necessarily? We would have to proactively ask for it. Yeah, now they will probably accommodate you more than, than a citizen um, being the, the board, but they have no obligation um, to tell you if a licensee is in non-compliance. Okay. I've, ne I've never heard of it. Okay. Unless you have a really proactive town that's, asking about it, uh, but you would have to be proactive. Right. Got it. Doesn't mean they're not acting on it, but it doesn't mean they're not, yeah, as Ron said, being proactive to notify you or, or you know, other organizations. Uh, not to make you feel bad, but I've come in to help many, many places that had state violations and I don't ever remember the cities being involved or the towns being involved because that's regulated by, by the state. Okay, but so okay. I have heard of towns that were concerned and they have gone to the state and asked for information. That, that, that's common, but they ask the state. Okay. You have to be proactive. Good question. I only have one more question related to this, and um, it was just because I I had trouble understanding um, all the acronyms. I just want to make sure I'm reading it correctly. So this is this is what happens with the the uh, creation of radiation is done with. It starts with electricity con is converted to high voltage. Is that radio frequency converted to radio frequency? Is that is that correct? Or what is RF something else? Don? Yes, and they're saying that's the efficiency of converting so much energy of electricity to the uh, uh, well, well, that's okay. I don't need to know the efficiency. I'm just wondering, like, are these, is this what happens as part of when you turn on the electricity, these are the steps it goes through to reach the end to create yes. radiation? Right, it's creating electromagnetic field. That's the RF that oh, will okay. take, I take got it. that electromagnetic field. Think of a magnetic field, electric field around something, and that electric field is what will accelerate that little tiny electron from point A to point B, the cathode to the anode, into, which is the target. Okay. And so, you know, and then they actually convert it, you know, to a beam where it's a steady stream of these electrons. And then they they strike the target, and then they get all absorbed, and the electrons essentially gone. And but all of that kinetic energy. Think of a baseball, and someone throws you a fast pitch, and you catch it in your mitt. Baseball stops, but you feel the energy in the mitt of that ball hitting your mitt. Bang! Baseball stopped. It's not moving anymore, but it had a lot of energy of motion, the kinetic energy of that 100 mile hour fastball or whatever it might be. And that was transferred into the whack into your hand and the heat and maybe the sting or whatever. In this case, the energy of that electron being uh, accelerated across this distance, it's only a few feet, okay? Um, in this accelerator hitting that target, that energy becomes X-rays, which are you know not mass, not a particle, but actually think of light, like visible light only, higher frequency. 
Okay, so it requires um, electricity and magnetism. Yeah, well, basically the electricity creates the electromagnetic field, yes. Got it. And does that, um, you know, when you think of magnets, does that have any impact on anything? And maybe you don't know, we, we had talked before, you didn't know if it would impact like radio or TV or wireless. Does that level of magnetism cause any interference that you can think of or no? It's electromagnetic field. It's not a magnet, it's electromagnetic field. Got it. I mean, they, they, I think they vary the electromagnetic field to focus the beam, but regardless, is it creating something that can interfere with electronics? Sure, but does it interfere? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, I think obviously they have other electronics there they want to protect. I'd assume they'd, they'd not want that to happen to their control systems and all of that, but does it affect things outside of the city and all of that? Uh, I, that's beyond my level of expertise. Uh, I know, Stara said no, but you know, I, 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 that's all they said, I think. Okay, okay great. Um, I don't know if anyone has, based on the, any of that, if anyone has any additional questions, um, that's all I had. Okay, then why don't we, Jim, do you wanna bring in the full team? Because I think there are some questions about the concrete plant perhaps, and I don't know if anyone has questions on noise or anything. And we also obviously will take public comments as well. Absolutely. There's just quite a few people. So give me one moment. Sure. Take your time. So I believe that is everyone and I'll do a, another scan. Are you all set, Jim? I believe so. If I'm missing anyone, you can, um, if you're calling in, you can use star nine to raise your hand uh, or you can raise your hand and I will move you over. But I do not believe I see anyone else. I, I think I grabbed everyone. Okay, is, is Kip on the line for a concrete plant? Maybe not. All right, well, I assume someone can answer questions about the plant at least in general terms, if anybody has any questions. Terry, excuse me, can I yeah, just point something out? Um, I just received an email 
um, that um, I believe it's someone that's trying to call in and um, there's two numbers missing on the agenda um, for people to call in as far as the webinar ID. But just before that on the agenda is the full webinar ID. Um, and obviously we have over 50 people um, that, that have that have gotten into the into the meeting. So if someone is, I just wanted to point this out that if someone out there is is trying to get onto the meeting and they're just looking at it from YouTube, if you go to the agenda and you know and use the Zoom link, the the number is is correct, the eight one two one, and then you know the number goes on. So I just wanted to point that out before you continued on. Okay, thank you for saying that. Um, okay, any additional, any questions? Let's go back to the concrete plan for a second because that is new information that we received since our last meeting. Um, do any board members have questions about the plant? Um, I sure, I do. do. Sure. Go ahead, Millie. Do you want me to pull up the plant plan or anything? Are you good? Um, I don't know if I need that. They're not really on the structural side. They're more on the elements of the trucking side. Um, the, the benefit of having the concrete plant on site is described as taking 2000 cement trucks off the road. Um, my question becomes that, is there a number of how many trucks there would be to put the raw materials? on site that then would be made into the concrete that then would be trucked over across the site to the um, the platforms because it seems like that almost like six of one and half a dozen the other um yeah I'm, I'm not sure excuse me madam chair um i'm, I'm uh, Mike, is that you trying to talk? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, so I, I have Kip's having trouble getting into the meeting. So I actually have him on my phone on speaker that he is listening to. We're going to see if he can answer questions through my phone and laptop. Sure. No problem. So can you folks hear me okay? Is that loud enough? Yes, I can. Nope. Terrific. Okay. So I did hear the question. And I do apologize. I'm having a very difficult time getting in. Uh, but I've been watching it up too, so to, you know, trying to keep up with what is happening. So to answer your question specifically, and, and I try to deal with that in the language that I wrote there as well, there's not a tremendous difference in the amount of material, because of course the raw materials are the sand, the stone, and the cement. And those, when you calculate all of that in, the only thing we really add is the water. So you are absolutely right, there isn't a big difference in the number of trucks. However, what we're able to do is to control the timing of what that, and when that material comes in. So rather than it being throughout the day while we're doing those pours during tra high traffic hours, the reality is we can bring materials in at times that we can prescribe. So it's not that the 2000 trucks disappear because the truth of the matter is we're really simply adding water to those materials and mixing them in the concrete plant. So I'd, I'd be disingenuous if I told you that we were massively reducing the amount of trucks, we're not. But what we are doing is we're controlling when that material comes in. So that during the times the kids are going to school or that you know um, traffic jams are happening during you know the, the specific hours, we would not be bringing materials in during those particular times and therefore have a much better control over it. Okay, so basically you'd still have 2,000 truckloads of raw material coming in. Over a year, yes. Over one year, I will bring in approximately 2,000 trucks of material, probably a little bit less but I don't want to, you know, bear on the calculations of what it's supposed to be. But please keep in mind that that's over an entire year that would happen. So it's not like it is, you know, I mean, I, I'm not sure how many trucks come into your, your typical warehousing situations there, but, you know, it'd be far less of whatever that's supposed to be. Okay. Does 
questions? Millie, does that answer your question? Yes, it, it does. I guess I was under the impression the way it was written is that um, that it would be taking those trucks off the road, but they're really just more determining when those trucks show up, it seems. Okay. Oh, did you have another question? I think that's it for now. I mean, I, I certainly, um, I guess what I'd like to know is maybe what's the water usage that you might be able to expect? Um, the water usage for the concrete plant? Yeah. So it's, it's a, not, not an extreme amount of water. I mean, compared to anything that you'd see, you know, in a typical um, industrial setting, it's far less. Um, the typical load of concrete of the, the, you know, speaking specifically of about five cubic yards, as I described in the, uh, in the writing that I sent over, is usually about 75 gallons in total. Sometimes, depending on the mix design, that can change, you know, between less and more, but not much. So it's not, hmm. a, it's not a tremendous amount of water. Hmm. That surprises me, actually. I think that's it for me for now. Okay. Can I ask a few questions? Sure, please do. Okay. So it was 2,000 truckloads for the materials with the concrete plant on the site. Would you say it's about 2,000 truckloads if it was just concrete trucks coming in? Yes. So in other words, all I simply did there was make um, a calculation based on the, approximately the number of loads that would have to be bought in for the building of the two shields, which is about 2000. And, and that what it was, and what I tried to go on to describe was that when you look at that, as I said earlier, that those materials were simply adding the water to that. So the materials are roughly the same controlling simply the, the timing and the clock, as I said before, but the reality is, is it, it provides, um, you know, we're simply combining all of those materials. Um, so, so those 2000 trucks would be in cement trucks coming from, um, you know, a supplier, uh, driving to the site through all different times during the day, um, with a lot less control over when that happens. So the idea here wasn't that we're completely reducing the amount because we're not by reducing it by any, any reasonable amount. What we're really doing is just controlling the clock on it more than anything else for a safety factor. Right. So I, I'm just trying to do the math here and just sort of try to figure it out and understand um, how this would space out. So if we didn't have the cement plant and we just had the cement trucks coming in, it would be the same, the 2,000 trucks over a year period, which is 52 weeks, right? That's right. Okay. So do you find that um, that is, you know, 52 weeks divided by 2,000 is about 38 trucks a week. Is that spanned out? Would you do that evenly? Or do you find that you might have more one week, less the other? I mean, you're doing it. And then is it the same likewise on a daily basis? Because if you were to break it all down, you could get as few as just seven or eight trucks during the day, you know, in an eight hour period. Or are you saying that some days you would have more trucks and others days you might only have one or two? How does that work yeah. when you don't have the, um, the, the, the facility? The, the used up pretty much on uh, not an equal basis, but, but certainly close. And what we do is we, we would separate um, uh, different materials being delivered at times that we were able to control, allowing it to flow into the site, number one, at times when it was more convenient. But, you know, to get to your point, um, it's not every single day. There may be a couple more trucks on a given day. Um, you know, we, we tend to use the, um, the cement faster than anything because there's more of that product that goes in. So that is a tanker truck that would come in to uh, to deliver that, as, as I described in my report. So, um, 
So we got a lot of control because we carry, keep in mind, if you look at it, what I sent you, we provide you, uh, we provide the area with a place to store it. So we're not reliant on the trucks coming in on a daily basis. We're reliant on the trucks coming in as we need to refill the, uh, the bins that we have existing in that place. So I guess I'm trying to, because if we can talk to the applicant about not having an on-site plant and just having the trucks come in, what does that look like? Does that look like cement trucks just coming in? And, and on average, you would say it's still 2,000 trucks over the course of a year versus it's just not the 2,000, as you described it, the 2,000 trucks are basically materials. So if you take that aside and say, we won't do the materials, we'll bring in the cement itself. That's the same 2,000 trucks. Is that what you said? And roughly that's about 38 trucks a week and seven trucks a day. Is that correct? That, that's, that's correct. And, and, okay. and as I said, the, the, the only difference is, is that um, the concrete trucks have to come in in a very specific order behind one another because we can't have any breaks in the concrete. So they'd be slowing. On days we were pouring, because as I described in the report, you know, one of the things that gets a little confused is there's this mindset that this plant is running every single day. It doesn't. It runs less days than it actually doesn't run, you know, more days than it does. Um, so so the, the reality is, is that we were able to control it, but it is really based on when we get that next level formed and in place with rebar before we do that pour. And then there'll be a quick rush on it for those for that day when we do the pour. And then those materials would follow in the few days that follow that while we build the next level of the pour. So let me understand. So, so I understand that you get it all built and then you got to do the pour and the trucks need to be lined up. How many trucks do you estimate that would be? Is it, could you have, you know, not being the hours of nine to 11, I need 10 trucks at that time and then I'm good for the day. Is that how it works? It, it roughly does. I mean, I wish it were it were around a clock that easy. It's not. It's it's a little more complicated than that. But the truth of the matter is that essentially what we would do is we'd set up specific times for those trucks and space them accordingly as best we can. The one of the difficulties we run into is when we do bring materials in from an outside source, we have what are called rejected loads as well because they don't have the proper uh, makeup of what we need it to be. And what that does is it creates a situation where we have to actually return that truck because it didn't meet the specification. We've run into that in other projects that have been done. So that's part of the reason why we like to be able to control that quality of material, both for the safety on the streets and the safety of the poor itself. How often would you say that happens? Like out of you know, 100 trucks, just maybe one or? No, I mean, it, it's probably, um, let me think, um, you know, anytime I'll, I'll be straight with you. Every single time I've done this, I've used our own concrete plant. So we've never, you know, we've never had a load rejected. Um, I, I would need to check with Steris on their other jobs that, you know, whether they did or didn't have a concrete plant, I don't know, but I can tell you that, um, I know on the California job, they had some discussions, particularly, for example, there was the first day that there was a lot of difficulty in the four. Um, there were trucks that were sent back, and then, and then as they as, as, as they sort of figured out what was going on with the you know with the third party concrete plant, they got it straightened out. So it's not it's not that common. I don't want to make it like there's you know hundreds of trucks running back and forth to pull out the concrete, but there it is certainly just another control mechanism that is in place if it's on site. Okay. Does that make the job go quicker, Kip? It does. It makes it quicker. It makes it safer. It makes it, um, you know, from, from the perspective of, of us ensuring that we, you know, have the proper materials put into the shields, which frankly is the most important piece of this, which is why it's tested to the degree that it is. We test it ourselves and it's tested by a third party. Um, uh, but it allows us to then, you know, um, control the, uh, the both quantity and the quality. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Additional questions? Um, uh, one for me. So, and again, there's just so much information to filter here through 
Um, in that concrete plant and the noise study, I don't know if I saw anything that specifically outlined what, if there's any particular baseline for you know, some of these other concrete plants that you've had running in the past um, and how, you know, any kind of measurements you might've taken that you can comment on. Um, I'm so sorry, uh, you, you were, uh, because I'm hearing it through a speakerphone, it's a little hard for me to catch that. Would you give me that one more time? I'm sorry, Steve. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, so looking through the noise report, as well as the concrete plant, um, I, so I'm going through this and I don't see any data, at least in the fixer, I, I apologize, I don't see it. Is there any baseline data on your current concrete plants or, or, or past concrete plants, DB levels um, that, you know, that you guys recorded over time? Well, for noise. Um, so um, the answer is no. Um, you know, as I shared with you folks, what I hope to be able to do with that uh, flyover that I provided was uh, to provide an actual form one of the other job sites. And unfortunately, the timing didn't just work for us to get it into you ahead of time. Um, what I can tell you is, is just like all of the information with respect to the um, emissions or anything else that occur with the concrete plant it's all very heavily regulated so from a sound standpoint it is um i don't have those numbers i wouldn't want to try to you know propose to you what they are but what i can tell you is that the you know any of the bulldozing equipment or loaders or anything else of you know typical construction equipment far exceeds what we would uh, produce from the concrete plant itself now keep in mind I have a loader that will be loading that concrete plant. So technically, I guess that would be part of the, the noise factor with it. But um, but the reality is it's no different than any other construction site that you folks have ever approved or been on before from a disturbance standpoint. Okay. And this was drilled down pretty much already, but just a, a quick question. So when those supply trucks come in, I assume typically you're going to use contractors. Are those mostly 10 wheelers or some mix of 10 and 18 wheelers? Or? Yeah, it's, it's actually a mix of both. Um, I'd love to be able to tell you that they were all tractor trailers, but I did want to confirm that because I thought this question might rear its head. Typically what we find is that the, um, the cement delivery is always going to be in an 18 wheel uh, because, you know, it, that, that's a very specific design with a tanker truck that actually dramatically pumps the cement into the silo. Um, the sand and gravel is typically done in what we would call a tandem or triaxle, which would be the smaller version, but obviously between 21 cubic yards or approximately 22 tons of material, uh, depending on what it was coming in. Um, that is what the suppliers in that area specifically, we would expect uh, to, uh, to be coming to the site. So we have a combination of both tractor trailers and uh, tandem and trucks. I think I asked this uh, before, and maybe there's new information, but it sounds like you, you have minimally three, maybe another uh, con not contractor, but suppliers for the raw material. Have you identified any of those folks and geographically where they may be situated? Um, the, the truth of the matter is at this point, I have not done a deep dive. We certainly contacted a few of them just to, to double check the materials that they have. But what I would need you to understand on that is, is that we create what's called a mixed design, which is a very specialized detail, um, piece of information. In other words, the, you know, the, 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 the hardness of the rock, the, mm -hmm. the amount of silty in the sand, all of those things are absolutely critical for us to obtain the, uh, the quality that we need in, in the concrete. So far more important to us is that, because that's what actually makes it up. But typically your concrete suppliers, you know, anybody who is in that area locally to where it's supposed to be, would be able to meet our mixed design. We typically sit with them, go over those details uh, to, a, to a certain degree, and then they would uh, supply us with, um, you know, what, what, what their testing is on all those different materials. Okay. Thank you. I have no other questions. I have another question. Sure. Um, so back to the cement trucks, um, if the board 
requested that the cement be done offsite and there be no cement plant. Would that be looking like um, much what Anthony just said? Is that truck similar to the typical concrete set trucks that we might see on the road or is it a different type of truck? It would. It would be what you would typically see the, the barrel mixer um, coming from the supplier to the uh, job location. And when you do that, um, I'm assuming that would come from one specific supplier because you're actually making them offsite, right? The answer is yes. We typically do have a second as a backup because what we can't do is, I think I explained to you folks before, is have a break in the pour. So if something happens where there's either traffic or anything else, we always need to have a secondary backup plan because we cannot stop a pour <laughs> mark. So, so you know, th that again goes to selfishly our side of why it is so important that we can do it on site. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the answer to your question is yes. Okay. So back to the offsite again. So you do offsite, you have the vendors, you could probably make a determination for that route for that vendor to come down 290. I know you're not familiar with the, the layout and the routes that are around this area, but um, the major highway is 290 and then comes off and comes through Berlin and then right onto the site. So it's not near any of the residential areas or any of the secondary roads. You could make that determination and actually give that route to your drivers, is that correct? There's no question we could and um, and and would be and and let me be very clear because you know I want to be very fair to the particularly to the, the the applicant in this particular case because I think it's important for you folks to understand this. There are a lot of reasons for, you know that provide safety and other reasons of why we think it's important to have the concrete plant on site. With that being said, I do not want this concrete plant to be the reason that there is a problem with getting this application approved. This is about the building and should be. And um, if, if the determination of this board was that we could not erect the concrete plant or you suggested perhaps to me, let's if we could vote on the application itself and move forward without the concrete plant, I came separately to your board to discuss that in more detail. Please know that from my perspective, we would we would completely respect that. The most important thing here is the application itself. And I certainly don't want to tell why you're doing here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, other questions? I had a question. Um, if you did use concrete off-site, is it still three in the morning, just like if you had it on-site? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that is that is done, um, as I think I explained to you last time, um, uh, primarily because of the, the heat during the summer, particularly. If it was winter, it could be different. We're, of course, hitting you with the worst case scenario. Um, but typically, you know, what happens is the concrete is a chemical reaction. So the longer that truck is out on the road driving to the site, that concrete continues to heat up in the barrel. Um, which is um, obviously a negative impact to the quality of the concrete. So therefore, you end up with more perhaps loads being rejected because the concrete does what we turn in the field called cook. And, uh, and it gets too hot and we can't use it for that reason. So again, these are the control measures that allow us to, but, uh, but uh, you know, it, it, you are correct. So if it was on site, you could start later possibly? Um, if, if, I'm sorry, I just want to be sure I'm understanding it. When you say on site. So if you had a concrete plant, would you be able to start the pours later versus three in the morning? Or you just said the trucks won't be coming at three in the morning if it's off site? You know, again, typically, what we love, yes, we have more control because we're not on the roads, which is critical. And we could start later. Again, I noted the comment I made before. If this is something about timing, We'll work through that. I'm never going to make any data for typically do three in the morning because there's nobody on the road and you don't have a problem or done by, you know, as I mentioned in the report, usually by noon um, of the larger pours are done. It'd be earlier than that um, because we have a tremendous amount of work to be done after the pour is completed. But again, whatever makes this board most comfortable is what we'll do. We'll work within the guidelines of what it needs to be. 
so that you folks can, you know, obviously feel comfortable yourselves and answer to the people that uh, they're going to ask questions about it because they're, they're all reasonable questions. And this is, you know, as I mentioned in my report, this is not something you know, that, that chugs away every single day and becomes a problem. There are far more days that we are putting in rebar and putting up forms and doing other things. The poor days are few and far between. And I identified those numbers for you so you can get a better feel for that. Kip, when a poor starts, how many trucks will that require? How often? How long? I'm, I'm so sorry. Say that one more time. You broke when, up a little bit. Um, when, when the poor starts, how many trucks will be required for the poor? How long and how um and, and how often? You mean with our own? Yeah, if, if we're off site and trucks start to come on site. Okay, so so if they're off site, we would typically expect, and again, depends on where the supplier is, how many miles away they are, but usually would be between seven and ten in order to maintain the line that we need. Um, we've had it up as high as twelve. Um, when we use our own, it would probably be only four. Wait, I didn't follow that. This is about time or numbers? Um, well, that was about numbers because he asked how many trucks. Time, if it, unless I misunderstood the question, forgive me if I did. Um, the time, as I said, can be moderated in accordance with what this particular board feels most comfortable with. Um, because we could control the temperatures and those kinds of things. If you said to me, I'm not comfortable with starting at you know, three or four in the morning and we wanted to start later, we would control that accordingly. Okay. Okay, other so, questions? Oh, go ahead, Michelle. So I just wanted to understand if it was off site, it could be seven to 10 trucks. But if you have the plant on site, it would be four trucks a day delivering the materials, right? That's correct. And I think my number was 7 to 12, if I may. I'm sorry if I didn't say that clearly. But typically between 7 and 12, it would be the kind of how big the pour is and, uh, and the timing of it. Is there um, a question of quality if it's done off? I mean, if it's done on site, do you expect better quality? Is there a quality no danger of off site? Yes, because what happens is, um, is that, that, you know, concrete suppliers supply many different types of construction jobs. So, so what happens is, is you could wind up with, um, they're not as detail specific as we are with regards to the. Um, the mix designs of what they're supposed to be. So typically what would happen is that that truck would still make the trip to our location. Um, it would be tested once it was on site specifically by the third party uh, testing company. And if it, if it didn't meet the requirements, it would be the load would be rejected and they would have to take that back to the supplier. And again, it's not happening every, you know, couple of loads. It's not that dramatic. I don't want to, I don't want to mislead the board in any way, but it does happen. And when it does, it just creates the double traffic pattern because now that truck is returning, plus they are bringing a new one in. Okay. Does it elongate the time it takes for construction in, in an offsite situation or not necessarily? I'm so sorry. I said to you, yeah, I'm not well, if, um, does it, if you do it offsite, does the, does the construction process take longer or same amount of time? Is it still a year or 12 to 18 months either way? It's, yeah, it, that's a great question. It's, it's really the same amount of time. I don't want to, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna, uh, uh, you know, try to pretend like because our own trucks are running it, we're going to speed that process up. The reality is far more days are putting up those forms and, and the rebar into the shields and getting the inspections and doing the things that have to be done to do all the safety checks than there are of actual concrete force. So, so the answer is, um, you know, that, that one year timetable is, is reasonable, but just remember that it's 28 pours for the two shields. Okay. Okay. Other questions? I, I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, you mentioned the 28 days of actual concrete man manufacturing for the shields. Um, would that also translate to 28 days if we did something offsite? That would be 28 days of tr the cement trucks coming in over the year. 
Yes, same, 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 same exact situation. So out of the entire year, only 28 days, or not only, but 28 days would have those cement trucks lining up outside as you need them. That is correct. But just keep, please keep in mind for me, that, as I described to you, that, and you said it, but I want to be clear, that that is for the shields. There are some other pours that need to happen. There are curbs, there are parking lots, and other things that will happen, but they're much smaller. So the answer to your question is, exact, is the same. Yes, whether it comes in, you know, in their truck or my truck, it's the same 28 days of pool. Okay. Um, and if you were to do raw materials, how long would that take for those to be delivered? Because you'd have to have them delivered pretty regularly to replenish your, your supply, correct? Um, well, as I said, there's really no difference in, in the amount, whether you have those 2,000 trucks in, in, in concrete trucks or you counted in our materials other than the fact that you know, some of ours is delivered in tractor trailers, which makes it a little bit lighter. Um, the answer is, is that it, it, it comes out to the same place. There's no, there's no, it doesn't change the numbers at all. What it does is, is it changes the control, our ability to control when and what happens so that we don't have on those 28 days that we're pouring the shields, for example, we don't have situations where, you know, there are trucks lined up out on, on you know, those roadways that, that you folks would be concerned about. Yeah, my, my only concern, and I know you've mentioned this, is that the concrete plant shouldn't be the, the stop. But if 28 days of delivering fr deliveries from cement trucks um, is what it takes to get the shields poured, what about, I mean, there's a concrete plant on site 365 days it's creating some dust and noise and light and disturbance of time so just trying to figure out what the offset would be for the residents and for abutting um properties it's, it's a fair question and, and again I, i'm going I'm to restate what i've said a number of times because i understand this board's concerns of what those are and the answer to it is there is no question that what it does is it enables us to more safely create concrete in a way that is going to be better for those shields because we have total control over what they're now. We're not just relying on, you know, some, some test that has done before. With that being said, I want to make it, you know, abundantly clear if you leave with anything here tonight, because you're hearing it from the contractor himself, I do not want this concrete plant to any way impact in a negative way your decision on which way this is going to go if you folks feel that you prefer us to do it another way we will accommodate that but i don't because it is far more important to get this um this project approved than it is my concrete plan so i just want to make that abundantly clear to everybody on this board appreciate that i have another question one more um so Similar to what Millie um, was talking about in the previous discussion, I don't know whether you were listening to it, we were talking to the consultants, we were talking about what are the measures we can put outside the building to make sure that there's no radiation leak out there and that for peace of mind for the neighborhood, we talked about these um, uh, sort of high quality um, environmental decimators um, that you can put around the building as well as a, a sort of a dose rate meter outside the building. So I know what you're talking about where you say this allows us to put controls into place so that we can make sure we have, you know, this very, you know, specific product in order to make these concrete walls, right? But in the same time, if you do it off site and you bring it back in, the, you know, in other words, you don't have a concrete plant. We can, we can still put um, tools in place that will help make a determination that everything is staying within the building as the consultants described that it would be. Does that make sense to you? It does. I think, I think you're probably right. I think that, um, look, at the end of the day, the reason we have this testing in place is to ensure that whether it's my concrete or anybody else's, that it meets the guidelines. And I assure you that Ferris would never 
let an ounce of concrete go into the shield that didn't meet that specific guideline. That's why they do their testing and I do mine and we compare notes independently. So there is no question that that would be the case. And, um, you know, um, uh, we would be able to, you know, ultimately, I don't want to give the impression that we're giving you a less capable product with the shield or the concrete because we weren't able to pour our own. We'll make it work. And, um, you know, as I said, at this point, the most important thing we can do is get you folks comfortable with what that's going to take to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Other questions from the board? That's it for me. Okay. Um, I just have a few questions for you that I started to ask before and um, we didn't we didn't really know for sure. So I just want to confirm um, in terms of if we are to have the on-site plant that um, the location of it won't impact any of the proposed drainage structures that are planned for the eastern part of the site? That's correct. Okay, and that you would actually build that out first before the cement plant would go on it? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And then um, I have a question about, so, and thank you for sending these materials. That was really helpful. And I, you know what, you're actually not gonna be able to see it because you are not on your computer, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I'm looking at, what page it is. So it's on page five of the report you sent and it shows like stockpiles of materials for the concrete. So are those stockpiles on site, whether we do offsite or on site concrete pouring, are the materials always stored on site? Or I guess not because you're not mixing it on site. So there'd be no stockpiles? You're exactly right. Um, they would not be those those materials, you know, while there'd be, you know, other things that from the construction side that we'd be clearly storing on site. Let me be clear about that. The reality is is those stockpiles would not be there if the concrete plant was not there. Okay, and if we do on site, um, what what prevents all of this from blowing around in the wind and it rains and it gets into the ground and all of that? So, um, you know, as I think was described earlier, um, there are a number of requirements that we are required to meet. I mean, these are these are put into concrete bins. If you look at the even the aerial that I sent you, you will see. Um, in real life, what that looks like. And these are uh, concrete structures that are created to store those materials. Um, the only thing that would, could even get airborne um, would be obviously sand, which is highly unlikely. I mean, it would take tremendous winds to get sand really whipping around. Um, but stone, of course, does not. And the cement itself, which would be very easily airborne, is actually stored in a silo for that reason. That enables us to keep moisture away from it as well as, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, keep it from, from blowing around. And then, of course, those, those requirements are specific to that we don't have runoff going into, um, you know, any uh, drainage areas or, or, or anything else. It's, it's, it's all highly regulated from that standpoint to be part of the site plan approval and, uh, and obviously uh, inspected as well. Okay, so did you, you're saying there's a cover on these bins that would, or there's just bins like open air bins? No, they're, they're like a three way, what, what, what I showed you. Uh, okay, I, mean, I think I'm looking at them. Okay, I just want to make sure I was looking at the right thing because it looks like an open air bin, but has three sides. Okay. That's right. And, and, and truthfully, you know, the, the one that you're looking at is an operating system. It, it works. It is, um, you know, is is it in area Chester, New York, which is kind of a rural farming town, so their homes very close by. Um, and you know, look, we are required to control this. This cannot be your worst nightmare of dust and noise, and you know, all of the all of the great questions that you're bringing up. It's, it is our job to ensure that even if we didn't have a concrete plant there that from the standpoint of all of the construction that goes on here, that we would be protecting both your community, your neighbors, and, uh, you know, everybody who you folks have, you know, in your ear talking to you about this. So, so that is what we do. You know, this is, that's our job to make sure that that all happens. And, and there are specific guidelines that we follow to, to ensure it. And even if there's something unique about your particular situation and an issue rears its head, we're going to figure out a way to solve it. Okay, if we were to do offsite and had an increase in trucks, say seven to 12, and you say they travel in a line, is there any issue with that many trucks on site as it relates to the um, planned infiltration basins? 
Well, they, they, remember, these trucks are arriving sort of in a staggered place. It's not like they're all going to be lined up on your road at the same time. We don't want them, you know, spitting in the barrels that long. So, so the trucks from off-site are, are going to sit on, you know, if they're waiting, they're going to sit on the side of the road waiting to be backed into position at the same pour that our truck would do. Okay. Um, and, and if it comes off site, there's no difference in um, potential for spilling out or anything like that? Um, no, I mean, it certainly is not any different than, you know, their trucks are the same as our trucks. Uh, the only difference is, I guess, it, you could potentially go on to it could spill out on the highway. It doesn't happen often. Oh, right, right. No, but I just meant like there's no... When you said quality, uh, impact on quality, that was the quality uh, of the concrete. Uh, if you guys, if you folks can probably imagine this concrete, particularly the level of um, detail that goes into it, it's a very expensive material. We're not interested in this flowing out onto the site, you know, into the, in, onto the ground. It is made to go into these forms because we spend a lot of money to produce it. And uh, we watch it very carefully and that uh, would absolutely do so on your job as well, whether it came from our concrete plant or came from a supplier. Okay, and what about um, start? our normal construction time starts at seven? So what does that day look like starting at seven? So, I mean, if, it, if we went with that, um, with that model, um, it would be just like any other construction project from 7 a.m., um, you know, probably till about, you know, during the summer hours, we like to grab more hours while we have the daylight. So um, if it was a, a, a acceptable, we'd like to be working later into the night. Um, but the reality is, you know, well, I'm talking about five o'clock. I'm not talking into the night. I shouldn't say it that way. But, but certainly, um, you know, it is, a, it is a matter of, uh, again, we, you know, my job doing this, you know, for companies like Steris and others all over the country is to listen to what your concerns are. And you folks are going to have, specific expectations and hopes that you can you know ask us to do and, and we're going to respect those so, okay no, so my we, concern is for people coming at three in the morning i don't like that at all so if we were to focus on like the hours of seven to seven which is normal time does that still make either operation possible like whether it's off-site or on-site it makes both possible Okay. And then what about lights? So obviously in the summertime, it's not an issue, but as we go into when we, the clocks change, what is the, is this lit up like a stadium over here or what do the lights look like when we're. Uh, no, we do. I mean, I mean, clearly for safety reasons, if we, if we're working into the, you know, we don't typically work in the dark. Um, uh, of course, 3 a.m. would be, but, but we have just a few lights that, that are housed on our concrete plant itself. Um, that are sort of self-facing into the plant itself so we can get things just sort of turned on. You know, by the time you start ma mixing your first batch and moving, it's it's later. You like to do it as soon as the daylight starts to break. But uh, but unfortunately, all of this takes some time to do, whether it's uh, whether it's on site or, you know, off site. Okay. And then um, any details on how any plans or details on how we'll be addressing the erosion and sedimentation protection measures related to the concrete plant or whatever's happening here? So, um, yeah, whatever's happening here would be, um, you know, we would follow whatever uh, the specific local guidelines are. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I know every rule in Massachusetts. We would do the homework on that to make sure that we followed exactly what it is supposed to be. Um, as well as I think I mentioned to you folks that we we have third-party inspectors. Now, I don't trust my own people. I do, but I want to ensure that we're not in a position that we're missing something. So we have third-party inspectors to keep an eye on those things as well. And um, you know, um, you know, as I, as I mentioned in my report, it's, it's really about you know proper management and uh, and doing it the right way. So you know, we have to follow what those specific guidelines are and ensure that we're providing um, the protections that need for, for the environment. Okay, so then no details on sedimentation washout basin or other sedimentation protection measures for the related to the concrete plant? It's okay if not, I'm just asking if you have any details on that. Or how you'd address erosion or anything like that? Uh, well, I mean, the, the site is, um, is typically surfaced in a material to prevent erosion. Um, you know, we don't want a mud hole there. As you saw in the video that I sent you, what we do is we, we line it with stone. Uh, for the protection so we don't have mud or, or other issues that develop. Um, obviously, some fences put in place and protected 
any washout is done um, uh, through a, a regulated process that we use um, washout containers for uh, that protects stuff from, you know, getting into the environment. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm sort of laying out for you what's been done in the past, but it's always sort of specific to what those requirements are. Okay. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, if I may, I can address that a, a little bit. The, the one person we don't have um, here tonight is the project engineer from uh, VHB. <clears throat> but what I can tell you specific to that uh, issue is that um, <clears throat> there are at least three different regulatory requirements that are gonna be in place to deal with the construction related aspects related to stormwater and erosion and things like that. Um, one of them is the EPA construction general permit. Um, and so that's federal stormwater and, and sedimentation permit. It's going to control those issues. So that's going to be a requirement that we'll have. Um, similarly, in the order of conditions, um, it has uh, three conditions, paragraphs 46A to C, that directly address um, uh, the stormwater and wetland uh, related controls for the concrete plant. Um, if that's the direction that, um, that, that, that the concrete production uh, goes in and that's gotta be coordinated with the town engineer and the conservation agent. Um, and then the uh, letter of recommendation from the groundwater advisory committee with respect to the special permit for um, the groundwater also um, recommends a similar provision which we've also incorporated into the special permit itself. So you're gonna have all kinds of controls over the, um, the operation of this concrete plant with respect to all the issues that you're asking about, specific to stormwater um, erosion and, and things of that nature. There's gonna be weekly reporting on that and weekly inspections in addition to inspections after um, any rainfall event over a half an inch, I believe is the standard. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And, and if I could just add to that quickly, just thank you for, for, the, for the clarity on it, is that, you know, this is all stuff that is typically done as we go through the building department side of this. Um, you know, I'm not as, as used to seeing it on the zoning side, but the reality is that these are all measures that are gonna be required to be in place. And, uh, and I can assure you, we will, um, you know, whatever has to be done will be met and uh, probably achieved, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. And it, I think we confirmed, oh, for the dust filters, um, that's something that I assume that's on all of the, anything that's stockpiled there, does it, do they each have different dust filters or you just don't, you, you mentioned that it would be unlikely that it would get swept up by wind or wh where do the dust filters go? Just within the contraption? So the, the dust filters are primarily for the processing of of moving the cement from the trailer into the silo and then from the silo into the hopper. And that's where those dust filters, uh, because that is moved through a screw, which is um, uh, almost like a conveyor, but, but, but kind of more you know, detailed it, 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 to bring this powder substance through. And then any place where there is um, a location where the cement itself lands into either the hopper or that is where those dust filters exist, which is why I provided you with the details on what was built into the plant. Okay, so I imagine you wouldn't want to inhale concrete dust. Do the workers on site wear masks or? Uh, no, typically they don't um, because of the fact that we don't have, uh, a, you know, really, you know, much of any effluent. I think probably the place you'll see the most of it is, um, you know, when stone or something is dumped into the hopper, there's a little bit of dust that comes off of that, but it's it's really not anything to, uh, um, you know, to, to be concerned about. Your other questions, I think, are far more, um, you know, critical than, than you worrying about dust. Dust is just not something we deal with often uh, because of those filters are there. Great. Okay, and I'd like to open up to public comments unless any board members have additional questions or staff has additional questions. No. Nope. Okay. Okay. I'm going to open up for um, public comment. This is a public hearing. So I am going, if you would like to make a public comment, you can please raise your hand and I will bring you over to speak. Um, first on the list here, I have Henry Scalante. I'm going to allow you to talk if you could just state your name and address. All right. I'm going to, yes, oh, there you go. Okay. My name is Henry Scalante, 72 Crestwood Drive in North Brook. I have some questions on some of the numbers. How many trucks did you say would be required to for the cement was that the 2000 trucks 
So, so what I what I did there was yes, that is the two thousand trucks is what it would take to um, to complete the two shields in. Okay, all right. Stop, the, stop for a moment. Point. Fine, stop for a moment. You said you're going to pour for twenty eight days. If you if you divide twenty eight days into two thousand, that's seventy two trucks a day. That isn't seven or eight spaced over three hundred sixty five days. But that's question number one. Question number two, what's the damage going to be with all the trucks coming up Whitney Street through Berlin into Northbrook? Now, I assume you can't go down Barefoot Road up Whitney because the underpass over 290, I don't think your cement trucks will clear that, especially if you have big ones. Uh, second question, you then go over a railroad bridge on Whitney Street. Will that take the uh, weight of these trucks? Okay. okay. Um, so, um, and uh, wait a minute, uh, just a, a third question, then I'll get off to get an answer. If, if you build a cement plant on site, how many of your own trucks, whether they're cement trucks, will be on site for, uh, for a, a period of time? Is it 10 trucks, five trucks? Because you'll be producing the cement, putting it into a truck, and then bring it over to the poor site. And the last question is, when you're testing the cement, you're testing the liquid cement still. You're not testing a hardened core, are you? Um, and I think. Last question. I heard the others, but I didn't hear that last one. Uh, okay. The last question was uh, we're, we're testing the, the liquid, not the a hardened core, correct? Uh, correct. So let me take okay. it in this order. Yes, we are, we are testing as the materials arrive on site, we're testing it after it's been. Uh, batched and mixed, um, and what we're, we're essentially checking for is is uh, air as well as uh, weight. So um, so that okay. happens uh, after it is been mixed or it arrives on site, dependent on the scenario that we are talking about. Oh, so you're testing for density um, effectively? Yeah. Okay. All right. I think that covers all my questions. If Henry, uh, could you just clarify your question about you had asked about all the trucks on site. What did you? Yes. Well, well, when I look at the site pictures that you showed of one of their facilities, mm -hmm. they're going to need cement trucks that come from the cement plant to the poor because it's not connected. They, uh, they produce the cement, they put it in a truck, and they bring it over to the poor site. If I'm if I'm familiar with cement plants, mm -hmm. so you're going to have trucks on site. Uh, you know, for a period of time, at least cement trucks. Okay. So I okay. Think, can I just carry right, so just... have the... Go ahead, Michelle. Go ahead. Thank you. Mike, maybe you can help him clarify for Henry's qu questions. I think what it is is when you, when you start with the math of 2,000 trucks over a 52 week period and you break that down, the math doesn't work out. So I guess the question was, and it sort of goes back to what Millie was saying, if you have 28 pours for two shields, is that just 28 days of seven trucks a day or 12 trucks a day? When you do that math, it doesn't work out to the 2000 trips. So I think the confusion is in the beginning of your introduction letter, it talked about 2000 trips. We talked about breaking down those trips to see how much the truck loads would be on the roads. And now that we're talking about offsite versus that the, the math doesn't work out. And I think that's what Henry is asking you about is how many trucks would it actually be? Because it doesn't, the math doesn't, when you break it down, it doesn't work out. Thank you, Michelle. So there's a couple of things to take into consideration. And this goes to his traffic question that he mentioned as well, which specifically is that, um, of course, if the trucks are ours and they're on site, they're not on the roadways uh, lining up in any way, shape, or form because they're maintained on our site. The concrete plant that we have, uh, the location of it, is on the same site, so we're not actually pulling out on any roads for any reason. And because of that, we can actually put um, more concrete into the trucks specifically in order to be able to do uh, deliver because we don't have to uh, meet the guidelines of what they are in the street. They're just driving around on the site themselves. So we have um, trucks that are a little bit larger, in a good bit larger in terms of what their capacity is, which is where some of the confusion may be coming from. But, you know, the, uh, the important takeaway is that if those particular, um, you know, you asked about 
where those trucks are going to be able to come if they were coming from off site. Um, that is absolutely an issue of what roads are acceptable, what roads are safe, railroad bridges, things of that nature would all have to be figured out um, with that particular supplier. And again, one of the reasons why we prefer to have those specifically on site. So, uh, one, uh, uh, okay, just, one, just one comment that I would think that the board would want to have some sort of clause in there that after all the pours or bring the raw material in, whether it's sand, cement, and gravel, you would want them to to repair the roads that they probably, by that time they bring in, uh, whether it's raw material or cement, they're gonna do a lot of damage to whatever road they're driving on. Okay, and the question about the railroad, that wasn't about an overpass, was that about the tracks? You asked about the railroad tracks? Well, or? The, a, a railroad bridge has a certain capacity that yeah. you can bring a truck over. Oh, okay, I got you. Okay, and the other one was an underpass under 290, uh, you know, there's a certain height to that, and I forget what the height is. I know the one on Hudson Street is 12 feet, but I'm not sure what the other one is. So, yeah, uh, yeah Kip, Kip, there's a um, to, to Mr. Squire's point, there's a, a weight limit. Uh, I don't think we'll be using the uh, the rail pass because there's a six ton limit. Are the trucks heavy then? Six tons. Oh yeah. 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 So yeah. so. Yeah. So through the chair to, to Mr. Squalenti, yeah, we would be coming off a, um, coming coming up uh, Whitney Street from Berlin um, in the rotary down below. We we couldn't we couldn't go go up through Whitney to be a, to be a Okay, okay. And with that with that question, I have a question. Does Berlin get a say that you can bring the trucks over their roads? And this is just a rhetorical question. Well, I don't, we don't know that actually. I don't think. Yeah. Well, I, I just, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. That, I think that answers. And thank you very much for taking my questions. Okay. Thanks, Henry. Thank you, sir. Um, just to, so then the, going back to the um, number question for a second. Um, so now I'm confused. It's not, so it's not a total of 2000 trucks divided by 28 days. It, so it's 2000 trucks in total that we are looking at here, but not necessarily if the trucks carry 10, 10 cubic yards per truck, that is uh, the way those numbers come out. What, what the difference here is, is that I was using the calculations based on our own truck specifically, which we can put quite a bit more on because we don't have to go out on the roads. Okay, so I misunderstood. When Millie first asked, or Michelle first asked, it sounded like there was no difference between on-site or off-site for number of trucks. Um, there is, I'm sorry, I perhaps didn't explain it well. Um, we are absolutely able to use more concrete on our own trucks because of them not going out on the road. Um, what I don't want to appear is that I'm trying to uh, slant this in a way that is, uh, you know, is, 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 is skewing the numbers. You know, we were basing this on, you know, how would this play out with respect to you know, having the concrete site on plant, you know, at the concrete plant on site. Okay, all right, I'm gonna bring in, um... Scott Stockland, whoops. So you're in an old version of Zoom. Zoom. You're gonna be promoted to panelists, which was gonna put you on video. So be prepared. Mm. <laughs> All right, you are rejoining as a panelist. It may just take a minute for Scott to join. Okay. Maybe that didn't work. Jim, do you see him lost in transition? So I'm trying to look for him now. I do not see him. There may be a, a disconnection issue um, due to the outdated client. So um, I'll keep an eye out to see if he logs back in. Mm, okay. Or else um, he would have to call back in. All right. So we'll, I'll move down the line then. And then if Scott comes back on, we'll, we'll pull him in there. Um, okay. Let's see. James Shore. I'm going to move you in. Okay. James Shore, if you just say your name and address. Hello, Madam Chair. My name is Jim Shore. I am a resident of Northboro here at 34 Coolidge Circle. And I had a couple of comments I'd like to make. Uh, first of all, I apologize for not making the meeting last week. Uh, I wasn't aware of it. And uh, I was supposed to be, because of my involvement uh, with this, being a butter to this, I was promised by the town that I would be notified. but. Um, I did not receive the information I requested last week about this, and I just received it this afternoon. Uh, it seems to be a problem receiving uh, emails from Kathy Jubert and I 
Uh, this happened before. So um, I apologize because there were some comments made about us, uh, about people being on the call um, and our commitment. Uh, just as the board knows, I've spent uh, close to $10,000, including donations from the neighborhood uh, to pay for lawyer fees to defend uh, against this uh, case here. Uh, we've spent thousands of hours on this project. Um, on top of doing that, just like everybody else, I have a full-time job supporting my family. Uh, I travel quite extensively uh, to per perform audits of very complicated manufacturing processes of medical devices, including sterilization facilities. Um, so I have some uh, knowledge of this process and what they're trying to accomplish here. Uh, just to give you an idea of how much time we've spent, uh, both my wife and I were deposed by the Steris lawyers for over eight hours, asking us repeatedly same questions. Uh, essentially, it was uh, a, a good waste of time and money on our behalf because we had to pay for the lawyers to be there. Uh, just as a side note, uh, it only took uh, our lawyer about a quarter of the time to depose their uh, people. Um, even after all of that time and money that was wasted, um, Steris tried to have my PILA thrown out. And again, uh, that is not going to happen. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, this appeal is still in play. So all the time and money we are spending right now hearing these cases, hearing the details of this, are a waste of taxpayer money and time because uh, as far as this appeal goes on, it's not going to happen. We can talk about this concrete. We can talk about it for hours, but it's not going to happen until this appeal is done. And if and when it goes to court, and if and when, if, if we lose, we will appeal it. And again, it's already gone on for years already. So I just want you to be aware that stand by, this could be quite a, a timeline for this to even go any further. Um, again, I apologize that you are having to go through this. And again, I, I would request that the time that the planning board spends on this to cease until the court case is finalized. Um, just as a side note, uh, my property is within 50 feet of the construction area, which was improperly stated by the ZBA and Steris. Um, that quiet area is my uh, area that I use to deal with my uh, PTSD and to have a quiet space where I can go out and do exercises. It's going to be dramatically impacted by this uh, proceeding. Um, and again, as long as I am the landowner of 34 Coolidge Circle, I am not going to, uh, uh, I'm not going to stop this appeal. Um, I have yet to get some answers regarding Steris. And one of my questions that I will ask at the end here is about the location of the other Steris facilities and the proximity to surrounding neighborhoods. If you look, they have not given you the answers. At least I cannot find that. So they cannot rel with honesty tell you the proximity of these manufacturing sites that they wanna set up and the proximity of residential areas. I've done some Google map searches. There is nobody near those in a residential area, not 50 feet, not 500 feet, okay? And, it, and, it, and, and, and also in the lack of data, they have no idea how dangerous it is to have this type of factory this close to the neighborhood. I have been inside sterilization facilities and seen the controls and operations of gamma sterilizers and ethylene oxide sterilizers. These processes are inherently dangerous. The people tell you that they are not and they are safe is not true. Those dosimeters that was brought up earlier are there, those measurement devices are put inside the, or with the product inside the carriers as they're put in through the conveyor belt system inside the chamber. So that way they can monitor and verify that the product got the right dose exposure. So for them to tell you that those things are not adequate, those are used in manufacturing as part of the process. And those are recorded and part of the uh, batch records that's part of the production uh, paperwork. Now, again, I've been in industry for over 30 years and you can't tell me and you can't convince me that light manufacturing requires the building of 12 foot wall thick, uh, wall, thick walls and ceilings. Um, and again, them telling you that this is inherently safe is not true. Safety controls are overridden all the time. People get hurt, people die, and buildings have exploded, including the facility and 
uh, sterilizing facility in California. Yeah, they can show you, but I have not seen any safety data to show that they have not had any reportable events to the, to the OSHA or anything regarding that. Just shutting off the power does not happen. If anybody's read uh, any books, all right, about safety in industry, a great book you should read is called Set Phaser on Stun by Stephen Casey, where he'll explain to you real cases of people that have died because uh, people have overridden the safety protocols. There's a story about a nuclear reactor where the operators overrode the safety controls and were evaporated inside the container, okay? There are cases where, in, like I said, the sterilizer in actually Ontario, California, where the people overrode the safety controls and caused the building to explode, causing thousands of dollars of damage the vessel was blown out and people were hurt dramatically. So this is not a, uh, a lie that you can have a safe process. That close to a neighborhood, I, I find that really to be disheartening, to think that Steris would try to feed the town and to feed this, this board that this is inherently safe process and had this close to the neighborhood is not an issue. On top of that, I've been in construction sites. I've been in the big dig and I've worked in concrete. It is not a clean process. The filters that they're talking about are not gonna do anything. If we go out there, yeah, we can talk about what we're gonna do, but reality, the people that are doing the work don't always know what we're talking about. They're not part of this loop. So what they do to get their job done may not fit what they're, being what they're telling to you. And it's gonna cover the entire neighborhood. Again, I have a little garden over on that side. I'm building up a little area so I can go over there. I'm gonna be covered in dust every day I go out there. And that's just not acceptable to me. So my questions I have, and again, I apologize. I'm a little, a little vocal and, and, and I seem to be a little on edge. I just, it's very disappointing to hear some of the statements that are being made as, as being told as truths when they're not in fact facts. Uh, my first question is, what is the distance of these other sterilizer facilities that are being planned to be built in proximity to the residential areas? And are they as close as here in Northboro? That's my first question. Is, is, do we have any information on that, please? Okay, why don't we start there? So we have Ontario, California, and Libertyville. And I just want to make sure. So it looked like the, the last we heard, they weren't in operation, but I had seen a response to a, a Residents email, I thought, Mike, you had said that two are currently operating. So are there two operating or no? But Mike, that question was for you. I don't know if you can, do you need me to unmute? Okay. So are there two operating already? Uh, no, we, we, we have several in, in construction. Oh, okay. I thought I missed that. I must have misread it or it, it looked like you had said two are operating. All right. So the ones that are, oh, sorry, go ahead. This is David Jackson, Senior Manager for Radiation Safety. Um, although we do not have x-ray facilities in operation, there are x-ray sterilization facilities in operation in the United States. Uh, we, had, we had answered this on a document quite some time ago, but there's, there's a, a company in Fremont, California, another one in New Jersey in the United States that are operating um, x-ray sterilization facilities, and there are a couple other ones operating throughout the world. Madam Chair, if I can interrupt, this that's is, not answering not the, the question. All right, all right guys, time. guys, you got to break it up. David, I'm going to put you on mute because we're okay. going to focus on this. Thank you. Okay. Jim, did you have a question? Yes. Again, we didn't hear the answer. They're not telling you the distance. Because, oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. then back to, on, so I'm looking at Ontario and Libertyville because the only three that I know of that I've seen from Steris in the material that I've received are uh, Northboro, Ontario, and Libertyville. Are there any other Steris US locations that have this exact technology? Mike. Uh, Mike Crowley, I think that's for you. So are there are those the three in the US that Steris has operating for this specific technology? Yeah, yeah. So, so again, Steris specifically does not have x-rays uh, in operation. We do have E-beams in operation. Um, and uh, again, the E-beam is produced by the same accelerator that we're talking about. Um, and um, we know that we have one plant that's about 
uh, we believe 500 feet from from uh, neighboring residents. Okay, so Ontario, how far is Ontario from residents, I guess? Is that the yeah, 500? I, I, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. See, I don't have any, any of that information. Okay. Um, or the do either no. for that? No, okay. All right, so Jim, we don't have an answer on that one. Do you have another question? So, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a, that was one of my questions. So 500 feet versus 50, okay. And then uh, I didn't hear an answer, and I don't know if it, this was answered in the information uh, of documents, but uh, what is going to be the impact to power and Wi-Fi and cable in the network, in this neighborhood? I mean, we're, we're talking about a lot of energy. Okay, I'm not an electrical engineer, but I know it's a lot of energy that has to take to generate this, uh, the, the source here and you know they're going to be doing a lot of construction here so what is how is that going to affect us since we're that close do we have any studies on that by chance so in the report that we got um, there was it was stated there was no impact and the peer reviewers did not have a comment on that um, Mike do you have any further com you, you, any information that shows that or data that shows that or just um, uh, again, Madam Chair, I, I, I um, obviously we, we meet with um, National Grid uh, to talk about the project and, and the requirements and uh, National Grid and ensures us that that will have the appropriate power um, and, and, and there wouldn't be any, uh, with, with the operation of our plant, any effect to, to the neighbors and, and their ability to, to run their appliances or whatever. Oh, no, but what about just with like interfering with wireless or radio or stuff like that? Not like a power thing, we, but a... We, we, yeah, we, we have no information that, that that's going to, uh, um, no evidence that, that there's going to be an issue with any of that. Yeah, so, okay, so that, that answers my question, which is there's no data to support that it won't impact us. Okay, the uh, next... I'm sorry, next no, I'm... I'm you have data? Excuse me, I'm sure that's, that's not what I said. I said... Um, okay. Uh, again, we have we have e beams that are running with with the same type of power draws and the same type of shielding, and and there's we we've seen no impact okay. to, to to that. Effect. Okay, so the 500 feet versus 50 feet. Okay, got it. Uh, and then the manufacturing the concrete. Like I said, not only is this you know I bought my house with the understanding this is like manufacturing. Uh, anything that requires that kind of concrete is not like manufacturing. But nevertheless, uh, you know, we're talking about pouring. I heard these conversations about last time about coming in at 4 a.m. over 18 months or 7 o'clock and working till 7 p.m. OK, I have a home office. The noise is going to be huge. And, and I, I mean, it's just the noise itself. Never mind the dust. The noise from generating from all those trucks is going to be horrendous. And I don't know if there's anything they can do to minimize the noise, it doesn't sound like it. They need a lot of trucks to come in there. Mm -hmm. um, again, I, I don't know what they're planning to do. And again, the whole, the whole dust and dirt of the neighborhood, I, I, know, I don't see how these little filters are gonna help. And like I said, when your boots on the ground doing the work versus what they're presenting to you are gonna be totally two different things. And I don't think the building inspector is gonna wanna spend his time in a concrete area because he's going to be covered and it's going to be noisy and it's going to be loud, uh, which is my third question regarding the noise. Uh, I saw a, a noise study that was performed that was done on my property without my permission, which is trespassing because I have no trespassing signs on my property. So for them to go on the, my property and actually conduct the noise study, I'm very upset and I'm going to take this up with uh, the, the town police here. For them to do that noise study, I have uh, consultants that I'm ready to hire as part of my appeal to prove that the noise will be exceed the limits that the town even has, never mind basic common decency to neighbors. So I'm really, really concerned about that. So I'm really, the, the extra noise affects my hearing. I lost my hearing due to my service in the military due to high frequency of helicopters and large, large caliber weapons. This kind of noise is going to upset my PTSD off with all this extra noise and, and, you know, high frequency that's going on. What are they planning to do to minimize that? And I don't think there is anything they can do. Okay. 
Okay. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Um, so we do actually have our acoustical expert on that can speak to some of Mr. Shaw's concerns in terms of um, what equipment was placed where and what mitigation efforts we have in store to um, uh, meet the, the town and, and state requirements. Um, that's uh, Mark. Oh, sure. That'd be great. Hi, Wallace. Mark. Yeah, Hi, any yes. comment from you, Mark? Yeah, this is uh, Mark Wallace from Tech Environmental. Uh, we're in Waltham, Massachusetts. Um, with regards to Mr. Shore's um, comment about being on his property, that's uh, totally inaccurate. We never went onto his property to do our sound uh, monitoring program. We set up a long-term uh, sound meter on the property, on uh, Steris's property, the property line. And we did do some short-term measurements in the neighborhood but they were all done at the street level, not on people's properties. So with regards to um, <clears throat> that, we, we, we never go on and to, onto anybody's property without proper um, uh, approval from the property owner. Uh, that's not the, the proper way to do that. Um, with regards to um, sound mitigation, our report lays out, uh, again, it's a conceptual design sound study, but we did uh, list a number of sound mitigation measures uh, that would would require um, using silencers on on the blower systems that they that they're proposing on the rooftop equipment, as well as enclosures for the for the chillers. Um, it's all sort of spelled out in our report, and I'd be happy to take any questions about that. Again, uh, as this process is going, and we'd be working with with Steris, um, you know, as they go through the final design. Uh, we'll continue to look at, you know, any additional mitigation measures that may be necessary um, to ensure that uh, we're meeting the sound limits at the property line at the nearest residence. And so we did that both from the, the noise bylaw that the town has, which is a five decibel limit above ambient um, at the property line. And then we'll also follow along with the mass DP noise policy, which also sets a, a allowable limit at the property line and also does not allow for uh, pure tone conditions, which are tonal sounds from, from different pieces of equipment. Um, and we also did the evaluation at people's homes. And that was all done through acoustic modeling. That's not going on people's properties. That's through uh, using standard uh, acoustic practices and acoustic modeling to assess what the potential noise levels would be um, at those particular homes. Okay, and the mitigation proposed, the, did the did it still meet the five decibels without the mitigation? That was just to make it even quieter. The, no, this was to make it actually comply. Yes, so it, it, it's not compliant. It wouldn't be it would be out of compliance. That's correct. And so, if construction were to occur prior to seven a.m., then that would also be a, comp a factor in the calculations. Uh, yeah. That, that uh, no, our our analysis focused strictly on the operations of the facility. Um, we did not look at construction noise. Um, and that's because it was our understanding, at least, you know, our, our work was focusing on the operations, not on the construction noise. That's okay. And yeah, and the, the fact is that the assumption was that they're going to comply with the noise bylaw, which is which is allowing uh, construction operations between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Okay. All right, Jim, does that answer your question? Uh, well, I guess, I, Madam Chair, what is... Uh, what is confusing then is on page 10 of the sound study, it shows that the receptors that were placed and the actual location, and then on page 11, it actually shows a map. Uh, so what I'm, what I don't understand is if those receptors had to, or someone had to go out there and measure them, those receptors had to physically be there, or am I missing something here? Because this is what the map shows, and this is what that table shows. Is that just modeling or is that physical placement? Yes, Madam Chair, that, that's modeling. So these are actually data points that are put into our acoustic model. Um, if you look at on figure, <clears throat> excuse me, on figure uh, one, page 11, we show a green dot where, where, where we did the long-term sound measurements. The white and uh, black checkered marks are actually just modeling receptor locations. So the lowest, lowest ambient sound level was not actually a recording, it was a model. Uh, no, that's incorrect. The, the lowest ambient sound level measurement is, is, a, is a measurement itself. Uh, then we do 
predicted sound levels from each each piece of equipment and then uh, calculate what the sound level would be, the potential increase in sound level would be um, through the modeling uh, each at each receptor location. So, so you're telling me R21 has the same low ambient sound level as somebody that's further down because it, our, uh, Madam Chair, R21 is my property. That's the rear property of 34 Coolidge Circle. Mm -hmm. uh, this model shows that R21 would have the same ambient sound as R20, even though my R21 is closer to a manufacturing industrial plant that's running. That's, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, is confusing me. Oh, okay. So is there a reason why that would play out that way in the modeling? Um, so what we do is, Again, I'm not sure what numbers he's talking specifically to, but the lowest ambient sound level um, was based on long-term monitoring um, um, at the property line. Um, when we did the spot measurements in the neighborhood, they were roughly about the same. So again, we rather base it on long-term monitoring because you can see the different fluctuations of sound that, that occur over that period of time rather than just on a simple uh, single spot measurement that we take just to justify whether our long-term measurements are accurate for representing the neighborhood itself. Um, if you look at table four on page 10, yeah, so we're, so the, the lowest ambient sound level is 38. Um, the, that's the, uh, the column that says lowest ambient sound level. Next to it is the projected sound level from the facility itself, from its equipment. Um, and then the total sound level is the combination of adding the sound levels with the, with the measured sound levels to come up with the potential future sound level. Um, and then that change in sound level uh, is shown in the sound level increase. So it's somewhere between zero and three decibels. Okay. All right, Jim, I want to make sure I give other people a chance to ask questions. Does that answer why you may not agree with the results, but did you get to get all your questions out okay? I did, Madam Chair, just as for the record, if necessary, you know, this, this will be escalated during the appeal because the sound engineer we have ready to hire will, will, will counteract and, and disagree with his, with his statements. And again, just so the board understands, this is a model. This is not, this is predictive. This is an actual data. Boots on the ground is going to be different. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank the board. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, I have um, Joanne Stockland. I'm gonna, oops, did I lose you? Nope, there you are. Okay, Joanne, you're on. Hello. Oh, hello, just your name and address, please. Hi, this is uh, Joanne's husband, Scott Stockland. I had to switch computers in the house. I okay. Hope so, um, oh, sorry, Scott, I just missed your address there. I just need your- oh, uh, 12 Patrick Drive. Got it, okay. So right, I just, I want to just make a couple of comments. Um, I've been listening to this meeting since it started at uh, six o'clock, and I hear a lot of um, a lot of talk about regulations, uh, inspections, uh, monitoring devices, and things like that. But at the end of the day, what this really is going to come down to, and the nexus for all of these regulations and inspections, relies on Steris itself. And sadly, uh, we the, in Northboro and this neighborhood particularly have been down this road with Steris before. In 1990, Steris came to Northboro with uh, some new sterilization, state-of-the-art technology using ethylene oxide and gamma radiation. And we were told it was safe. Less than four years later, something happened. And there was a release of 20 pounds of carcinogenic ethylene oxide into the air, requiring neighbors within a half a mile of that site to be evacuated. The Northboro Fire Department showed up, the Berlin Fire Department showed up, and they couldn't do a thing. They had to sit there and wait for over an hour for federal hazmat um, uh, investigators and responders to come and deal with this situation. So now it's 2021 and Steris is coming back to Northboro again with a new sterilization technology called X-ray. And again, we're being told it's safe. Don't worry, we've got all these regulations, all these inspections are gonna happen. Nothing's gonna happen to you. Yet, this is a company with a very poor safety record. They have been cited by OSHA 15 times in the last 20 years and been forced, and the violations have been so serious 
that they've been assessed uh, penalties. And some of those violations have been repeat, meaning that they were told it was a violation, they didn't fix it, they came back, they inspected it again, recognized it again, and finally slapped a fine on these people. That's almost once a year. That's unacceptable. And that's unacceptable for a residential neighborhood. And so I'm asking the planning board to deny this application for the following reasons. Number one, this technology is too dangerous to exist within a few feet of a residential neighborhood. In addition to that, we're dealing with a company with a very spotty safety record, which has already endangered Northboro. This happened, this leak happened in 1994. We don't know 26 years later, whether there are any people in the area that developed cancer. I would love to find that out. I don't know if we will ever know that. Finally, or, or next, the, the construction plan, and I know it's, it's being um, potentially changed here, but starting at 3 a.m. is absurd, quite frankly. And I don't know if that was a uh, negotiation ploy that was kind of thrown out there, expecting the town to push back on it, and then they would say, oh, well, okay, we'll acquiesce on, on this piece and seem like it's a good neighbor. But that, quite frankly, is absurd for over a year. You're expecting people to sit here in the dark while construction is going on with lights like Gillette Stadium going on in the background and all kinds of noise. And you just heard Jim talk about the fact that people that live along this boundary are largely working from home these days and may continue to work from home. How are they expected to have conference calls going on and talk to people at work with this kind of noise going on a mere 50 to 100 feet behind their house? All right. And then finally, um, and this is something that nobody has really talked about yet, the, the town is creating a single use property. Down the road, when Steris has come and Steris has gone, what are we going to be left with? You're going to be left with an unusable blight that nobody's going to be able to do anything with. Nobody's going to buy a facility with 12 foot thick concrete walls in a maze structure. So this structure is gonna sit there. It's gonna be extremely expensive for somebody to tear down. Nobody's gonna do it. And you're just gonna have another dead piece of property similar to what this town did with SA Farm. He has basically turned 13 acres of Northboro into a dead zone that nobody is ever gonna be able to do, deal with again. So that concludes my comments. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you, Scott. So um, I don't know who can answer this question. I wanted to follow up on Scott's concern about um, safety record in general for Steris. I don't know if who's the right person for that. If you just either unmute yourself or raise your hand. I don't know if that's Mike or David or who is good to answer that. This is David Jackson, uh, Madam Chair. I'm, I would not be prepared to, to look to, to answer that right now. I, I don't recall OSHA violations of that magnitude or that number, but I would actually have to do some research before any answers on that would be provided. Okay, um, Mike, do you have any information? So um, I, as you know, a lot of neighbors um, sent over information today and there are quite a few files and articles and links to the violations that were shared with us. And I, I assume you received all the emails as well. Did they come to you, Mike? Um, yeah, Madam Chair, I, I, I did look at a few of them. Um, what I can say is that we have a number of facilities across the country and, and, and across the globe. And um, to have um, a violation in one plant here and there with, um, uh, upwards to, to 60 plants across the globe. Um, it's it's um, kind of unfair and, and, and maybe a little misleading to say that we have um, an, an awful safety record. We're actually proud of our safety record. We're, we're proud of um, our uh, safety to our employees with um, um, so many plants going years without any safety incidents, OSHA recordables or OSHA days away. Um, our, our, our record of overall um, uh, for, for across the country is, is world-class. And um, I would 
really put our organization up against anybody's organization when it comes to safety and, and the safety of our people. And, and quite frankly, also the concern for our uh, residents. Okay, so, you know, so I'm gonna, here's an example. This looks like it came to you specifically just recently in um, 20, for, in, it was filed in March, 2021, and it's from violations from 2020. This is to you, yeah. and it's Correct. for air pollution control and failure to maintain records. So, so that, that's is something that. specific to no. you? No, so, um, so, Actually, what you what you're showing here is um, a record we we were just audited with the um, with the DEP, and um, the citations that that they had had to do with the installation of a generator that we have on site for the um, safety equipment, um, uh, the the abatement equipment for the EO process, and the um, the issues raised by the DEP inspector. Were, were mitigated um, within within a month or two. Um, it had to do with uh, pulling a certificate for the installation of, of a gas uh, natural gas fired generator that um, originally the inspector thought was installed on one date. It was actually installed earlier. So so some of the some of the things that he had um, initially thought that were relevant to the generator were not because of, of the date of installation. But it, again, um, it was only with uh, the installation of, of the generator and, and the record keeping was just um, keeping an accurate record of when the generator starts and when it stops. So um, it's, it's, again, the air, air pollution control is, is a little misleading, but it was just the installation of the generator uh, the certification of the generator when it was installed, and then um, maintaining that record of, of when the generator runs. And the generator um, only runs a, a, a couple of hours uh, a year, if that. Um, and, and I think the threshold is, is 300 hours a year. And that's just because it's a backup generator. So it's, it's not being run on, on a regular basis, Madam Chair. Okay, that's fine. I was just curious. So, and then it looks like, so we were, we did receive links to, I think um, Mr. Stockland had sent over what he was referring to with what he saw for, um, what he's referring to for the 15 violations. Yes. Just, the, yeah. it looks like it doesn't tell location. So I guess I don't yeah. want to send everyone, but these are just typical violations yeah. across the country so yeah so so some are in um new jersey minnesota el paso texas uh, ontario california um spartanburg south carolina so they're spread over uh, across uh, a, a number of plants i didn't really get into the weeds of of um, um what they what they actually were but um they're they're not, uh, we, we, we never want to have a violation, um, but uh, they're, they're, they're not very egregious by any means. Okay. Um, and Madam just Chair, Matt. I'm sorry, I'm just finishing Matt. up here. Okay. Yep, like that's okay. I just that. want to make sure um, that so um, Scott had commented on these things and I know you didn't necessarily have answers for them, but I just wanted to represent what Scott had sent over. Um, and I think I took him out of the, the um, panelist box. Scott, you still have your hand up. I don't know if that's on purpose. Scott, did you have something? Did you have your hand up still on purpose? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the other things that he had sent over was just in terms of, and speaking of these, the um, leak that had happened in Northboro, it, it notes that there were there were fines, there were viola safety vi four safety violations from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and also a violation from the um, the atomic the Atomic Energy Commission had also found, um, you know, across the different, I think there was only a, a few a few for the Northboro one, but then other problems on other locations from the Atomic Energy Commission. So those are some violations that he had shared. Um, 
he had shared an article about the leak um, in the town. And then he had sent over um, just, just issues that the fire department had noted in 2005 that um, a couple of things are really concerning to me and I was hoping that you could maybe speak to is that um, it had been noted that there was a pattern of a lack of safety of employees, pattern of lack of regard for the safety at the facility. I mean, I'm sure you read this note. I think it makes a lot of, the fire department at the time made a lot of um, serious concerns about safety and violations and um, following uh, protocol that I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, or um, it would be good to understand why that was the case and why it won't be the case any longer, how we can be rest assured that that won't be the case any longer. Um, I think that's all that we got from Scott. Uh, I just wanted to represent that. I know any comments on that, Mike? Um, only ma'am fear that this is, this is not within the scope of, of the discussion for 425. Well, no, I'm talking about your um, the operations of your company in general, not related to, it could just be that how your company operates. I'm curious to find out if a, a resident is asked, what is the company's history or um, you know, what is there for safety or violations or things like that? Um, I think it's related to your company operations. And sure, and yeah, I'm sorry, ma'am. And I, I thought I just spoke to that, that um, the, the, again, you're, 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 you're bringing in the, the operation or the performance of, of sites across the country, one here and there over, over um, you know, 15, 20 years going back and talking about incidents that, that happened 20 years ago. Um, uh, that I don't, I don't know that are, are okay. relevant to this point. Madam That's Chair, great. I'd like to comment on that as well. Sure, go right ahead. I, I think this is more than a little unfair to Steris and the applicant. We're in front of the planning board and we're in front of the planning board for two items of zoning relief. Um, one is related to groundwater and a special permit for groundwater. And the second is for site plan, which is to address ingress and egress to the property. Um, to dredge up things that happened 25 years ago on a project that your own peer review consultants said, one, one, of, one of the quotes was, you could operate this system 24 seven and no one was harmed. Another quote, direct quote from your peer review, this machine is inherently safe. Nothing is needed to stop it except the concrete. So to go back, and now we're talking about OSHA violations, and I just think that this is tremendously unfair to the applicant, especially given the nature of the <clears throat> relief that's actually requested from this board um, by the applicant. It's groundwater and it's site plan review. It's not regulating ingress and e or it's not doing anything more than getting to the site and getting off the site and being able to do that safely in vehicles and are the buildings arranged in the right way and things of that nature. This is not supposed to be an audit of every um, uh, uh, you know, inspection that Steris has had at every one of its facilities all over the world. And of I course. just think that I just think that's a little bit unfair to try and take into something that's supposed to be groundwater and something that's supposed to be site plan review. Well, and part of our, and, well, okay, I've heard you, no, excuse me, excuse me, I'm responding to what you said. I, part of what we do is to ensure the safety. Much of what the safety of this project involves is a high level of reporting and regulation. And I'm just wondering, and I've asked as it's been brought up to us and submitted to us, what is the history in those areas? Because it is part of, our review to determine if this relies on a, a high level of reporting and regulation that we don't even have the insight to. I'd like to understand because it sounds like we have to be proactive about the report if we access the reports. I'd like to understand what is happening. Are there issues? Have there been issues? And that's all. It was just, a, just to get that out there. And no one is trying to hide anything from, from the board. In fact, I think we've been um, more than open with the board in giving you folks all kinds of information, as much as we can possibly provide and as much as we have available to us. We brought the whole team out here on a number of occasions and we've paid for peer reviews on subjects that the board has no jurisdiction over. All of these questions about radiation and the x-rays and, and all of these things are subject to exclusive state jurisdiction which is something that this board has been informed of and knows of. And perhaps you need some more guidance from town council. Um, but we would really 
appreciate being able to stick to the zoning questions of what we're the, for the relief that we're we're actually stand we're actually requesting from the board. Okay, um, I'm going to so, get back to public comment. So I'm going to pull in um, Ann Beckstrom, and I have you on. If you just state your name and address. Hi, this is Ann Beckstrom. I live over on 152 Bartlett Street in North Row, and you know I've just been listening to public commentary and um, discussion previously, and I just. I'm kind of floored. I, I think it's absolutely outrageous that we could actually think that an operation like this could be happening 50 feet um, within a neighborhood of you know, abutting neighbors. It's just, it just floors me. And I guess that's, I'm happy that I don't live in that neighborhood because I just wouldn't be able to bear it. The noise of having trucks coming in and out at those hours of the morning and uh, construction operation like that it's just i just find it absolutely outrageous so i just wanted to make that comment okay thanks ann okay oh no did i disconnect ann i may have um jim could you make sure that ann's able to get back in in case i disconnected her oh no i see no, her. i see her yep yep i thought i disconnected her okay i'm going to bring in um rachel burnswig uh, Rachel, you're going to be promoted to panelist, and we may lose you as a result, but oops, there you are. I think we, I think oh, there you are. Yep, just All right, you're okay. Uh, I hope not to disappoint. This is Rachel's husband, Michael. Um, but I have to say, um, oh, right. you know, I'm sorry, just your address. Yeah, for, for Jenkins Drive here in Northboro and our family has lived in the town over 15 years. Um, I have to say this, this project, um, the scope and the, the level of what's being discussed is, is quite honestly scary. Um, you know, I, I find in the meetings that I've attended, the answers and the documentation and responses provided um, have been somewhat evasive to, to be honest uh, just looking from the other end. to to be upfront um i don't think i've ever seen any corporation over the years bring in the level of attorneys and consultants and you know individuals to this board it almost feels like like there's a level of, of strong arming going on here um at the end of the day you know, it, it does not feel like the right project uh, for the town, does not feel like the right project for the, the groundwater and the other concerns that are in that area. And for the residents of the town, I think at the end of the day, I think in the best interests of the residents of the town of Northboro, I think there are many projects for this 425 Whitney Street that, um, pose a much lower level of risk. I think the level of risk is, is being minimized. Um, I also think that it's been presented as a, an operation that's not 24 by seven, but just looking at all of the other operations across the country and around the world from Steris AST, uh, I, I don't find that to be accurate and even just a quick look of, of some reviews from actual employees of Steris AST uh, across the country, just, just within the US. Um, I just wanna read two, two quick quotes right here from an employee. Um, the average, average employee rating of, of people actually working for this company in the US for this division is 2.7 on a scale of five. Uh, one employee writes, the communication is terrible at best. Management cares more about themselves. There's a huge turnover rate of employees, so you're always understaffed. And they, they end by saying they give all new employees, and I think we're talking about production level employees, uh, day shifts and, and stuff people who have been there the longest on night shifts. It takes an act of Congress to move someone from night shift to day shift. There are no, 
there's no one that wants to work nights. So to say that this is going to be, you know, a, a daytime thing, I don't think that's accurate. So just wanted to get those points out there. But I think in the interest of the residents of the town of Northborough, I think there are many other, you know, operations with without 12 foot concrete walls and, and legions of people trying to minimize, uh, you know, what the, the real impact is here. And I think a, a quick search of, of, you know, different and, uh, you know, things against company over the years, you know, shows what I believe is the true story. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. All right, I have one more question, it looks like. Um, actually, I have two more. Um, Henry, I'm gonna bring you back in. Do you have something new to add, Henry? Yes, uh, just a comment that uh, Mr. McKay made. Uh, I, I, I wanna thank the planning board for looking out for the issue, for the safety of the town in Northborough, not just looking at the one or two things they were supposed to look at. But I, I, I'm glad that the board will take the time and the effort to look at all the issues and not just the two they're supposed to look at, because that's a lot of times what the boards do. They're told they can look at this and this and this, but nobody looks at the whole picture. And I think you have been. So I want to thank the board. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Henry. All right, and it looks like I have the last one here. Um, John Wickstead, I'm gonna bring you in. Yep, just your name and address. Hi, it's John Wickstead, uh, to Stirrup or Glen in Northboro. Um, I, I just had a comment regarding, you know, Stairs Corporation. This is a, you know, this is a multinational corporation with facilities all over the United States and in many other countries. And I'm just wondering, how much effort they've put into finding another site that isn't 50 feet from somebody's house. I mean, it would be impossible to find a five acre industrial site that is closer to houses. Like when you look at the North row map, like, you know, this area of Whitney street, there's not a single industrial site that is as close to houses and as many houses as this site. And I recognize that Steris has value in putting their facilities close to the highway. And it's close to an off-ramp on 290, and that 290 interchange is close to 495. And I'm sure that has business value for them. But I just wonder why a multinational corporation can find a five-acre site close to a highway off-ramp that is not 50 feet from somebody's house. Oh, is that it? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to put you back there. Um, I think that was it for comments. I'm going to... Um, just quickly recognize uh, some communications we received today for the record. Um, I'm gonna, I think I, I'm gonna run through just quickly. We had, and just make sure everybody got them because we had quite a few come in at the same time. So we had an email come in from Diana Adams Woodruff at 46 Coolidge Circle who expressed concerns with the plan and the concrete facility as well. Um, just expressed concern with that in general. Um, we had an email come in from John and Leona Zawaki at 26 Coolidge Circle um, that they've been in town since 1975 and had some concerns about the project, the building of the 12 feet walls, the cement mixing, the hours of operation or the hours of cement starting at 3 a.m. Um, and had some concerns with that. Um, we covered the, um, um, Emails from Scott Stockland. I think that was 19 Patrick Circle. I'd have to check at the original email. Um, I think it was 19 Patrick Drive. Just with a link to the violations that we reviewed, um, another email from Scott Stockland with the article about the leaks. I have an email from um, Russell Lang, which actually I don't have an address. Oh, 21 Coolidge Circle um, had some con concerns with the plant being 1,500 feet from his house. Um, let's see. Had concerns about property values. Um, Scott sent a, a long, oh, 12 Patrick Drive. Scott Stockland's from 12 um, Patrick Drive. He sent in a longer email that had some questions. Um, 
the process being dangerous near people, um, question of light manufacturing being defined as less capital intensive and more consumer focused. The construction plans had concerns, especially about the timing, the lighting, the noise, the trucks, dirt, debris, um, had concerns about noise level after construction. Um, what to do if there's an accident, what kind of plans or emergency plan is in place? Uh, will there be a plan for residents to have as well if there's some sort of emergency? Asking about the concrete walls for cracks, any issue with the water supply, cell and wireless um, interference, who in town is responsible for it, um, people working out of their homes. We had an email from Bob and Rhonda Van Buren at 150 Maynard Street, um, also expressing concerns in an area next to residential. Um, who, let's see, thought, who had concerns with the project itself, noise, trucks, and early morning disruptions, um, that part related to the concrete site. Um, we had another email from Scott that shared the concerns out of the fire department and another article that we referenced earlier this evening. We have an email from Jody Martinson at 15 Coolidge Circle that she's been in the neighborhood for 50 years abutting the what was supposed to be an uh, industrial park for light industry um, that over the time she's feel, she feels has expanded beyond the initial scope of what it was intended to be. Um, let's see. We have an email from Brian and Kathy Harris at 416 Whitney Street. Concerns about the special permit site plan approval and the special permit for the groundwater. 22 years in the neighborhood had concerns about long-term impact on the neighborhood. Um, didn't, didn't understand that or concerned about the need for 12 foot thick walls next to a residential neighborhood. Asked about questions if it was ongoing radiation would be harmful to the families and children. Um, asked if it was consistent with light industrial. Asked about environmental impact of the building and the concrete processing facility in groundwater. Um, asked on impact on water and air. Asked about impact on environmental safety. Asked about the concrete plant noise, trucking activity, impact on residents with respiratory problems. Noise at 3 a.m. Those are the concerns there. Um, an email from Kerry McMullen at, uh, no address. Oh, her family is in Coolidge Circle. I don't have the exact address. Um, she had concerns with any sort of impact on kids outside, if there's any um, issues there. Um, and wanted to know about other sites in the country that do this processing asked about um, if if we were comfortable as a what she termed as a guinea pig um, that had concerns about the 12 feet thick walls um, we had concerns about the safety if this hasn't been tested before um, had concerns about the original variants the construction how, how noise complaints will be dealt with um, what the real financial um, benefit would be compared to what the risk is with the project. Um, just questions of safety. I think that's it. Um, I have an email from Lisa Stone, 17 Coolidge Circle. Um, she had just asked about um, risk factors, just business and operational risks that were listed in the financial, the Starris Annual Report and wanted to know what kind of risks would be related to this project, whether it's um, any sort of events or let's see, casualties, injuries, um, anything that was called, she just had shared the, um, that section from the financial report with us. Um, I have an email from Bonnie Lang. I think her questions are answered actually. Um, let's see, she had some questions about the Concrete facility, which was explained to her, was temporary. She had a question about the being the first in the U.S. to have a facility, and this the answer was that there were two other similar facilities operating in the U.S. Um, risk of an accident was answered. There's no risk. Um, if it's really light manufacturing, 
Um, the answer was that we don't, Steris doesn't manufacture anything. It's a sterilization process. Um, asking about the walls being a red flag, the answer was not, a, it was appropriate, mathematically calculated. Um, effect on groundwater, answer is no effect. Hazardous materials, none. Um, asked about traffic and noise, answer is no impact. Property value is no impact. I think that's that might be the end of it. Through the chair, um, Bonnie Lang had reached out um, through the Zoom host email. I had instructed them to um, raise their hand during the uh, public comment period, but I did not see them raise their hand. Um, and same goes for Gina Babcock. They both had answered, uh, asked questions, oh. and I had asked both of them to raise their hand during the public comment period, but I did not see them. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so do they... Uh, um... So it's Bonnie, Bonnie, did, did Bonnie have her hand raised? I missed it. Uh, no, so neither of them raised their hand throughout the period, but both had reached out um, through the Q&A and through Zoom host email. And I had instructed both to raise their hand during the uh, public comment period um, so that their questions could be reflected in the public record. Oh, okay. Bo Bonnie, do you have a, do, Bonnie, I brought you over. Do you have a question that you wanted to? Oh, I was just saying that, um... That whole, you know, starting at 3 a.m., you know, is going to be a huge issue for the neighborhood for the, the year. And I couldn't understand how that could be like an acceptable, you know, just run of the mill. Yeah, this is what the company is going to do. But also, the like, I think other people have voiced the, the concerns that I have, which is I can't imagine why we would have such, such a, um, you know, there's so many, there's so many reasons not to go forward with this that uh, I just can't, I just can't believe that Northboro, my beautiful town, is considering this and that we might go through with this. It's like a nightmare. So I think we've talked about it and there's many reasons. I don't think we need to go into it again. Um, so I, you can just state for the record that I, I agree with all the concerns and I don't think it's, you know, like I think it's been minimized here. Um, the, the real concerns to to like the residents here who live here. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then Gina. Gina she did, did wanna... have her ra uh, hand raised, but she lowered it. Yeah. Oh, G Gina, did you want to talk or no? I lost you. Gina, we lost you. Okay. Oh, there you are. I'm sorry. Okay. Gina, did you did you want to say something? Oh, shoot, I did it again. Oh, Gina, did you have anything to add? Maybe not. You keep raising I, your hand. Just, I oh, okay, believe there you go. she's Am I unmuted now? You are, yep, okay. I just need your name and address. Uh, 50, Gina Babcock, 54 Coolidge Circle. Okay. Um, my question is, um, uh, when they, uh, criteria for construction for this facility is you, they're supposed to have a year to construct a building. Is that is that the criteria or? Well, I think Bob had mentioned before, Bob Federico, um, the zoning enforcement officer had said that they can, um, they would have a, up to a year, I think temporary structures are a year, and then he could extend that by six month periods or so, whatever the yeah. extent okay. period was. Yeah. But in the bylaw, it says one year. Is that correct? So the, the bylaw has in the definitions, it's a 12 month, a temporary correct. structure is a 12 so month. So why is that in the bylaw? Why do they have that limitation is my question. Yeah, that's a good question. Do, does anybody on staff know if that's something? I know Bob's not here. Is that something that he can just indefinitely extend or we don't? No, no, it's not. But the bylaw is not written for Bob to answer. I want to know. Oh, right. It was written, right, for a reason. It, it, it limits the time to construct a certain type of building. Is that not why the bylaw was established? Um, so if you're going to build a a 10 story building that may take five years. So, right, I definitely hear you saying, I think the, the de definition of a temporary structure doesn't necessarily um, 
apply to construction. It's just that in this case, it happens to be the concrete plant is a temporary structure, but normally we don't have um, like a temporary structure, I believe could also be like some sort of tent or some sort of whatever the definition is. For well, I'm not saying temporary structure. I, I think the bylaw is like, you know, it, it, if you're going to build your building, it's going to take it's going to take, you know, we're, getting, we're giving you one year. Well, right. So you're right. So a temporary structure, a structure without any foundation or footings to be removed within a 12 month time period. So that was put there for a purpose. And the purpose is so we don't have companies like this coming in and saying, oh, it may take us two years and then it might go on for three years. The bylaw is there for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. It's it's to limit companies like this to come in and, 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 and build these outrageous 12 foot concrete wide wall buildings. It just, it doesn't fit the criteria and it should not be allowed and it should never have gotten this far and I don't know how it did. So somebody needs to look into why that bylaw is in there, who put it in there and why it's there. It, it's the safety for, for us, the town, not the neighborhood, the town. That's all, that, you know, that's, that's my, what I have to put in and it, it should not be allowed. Okay, thanks, Tina. Thank you. Okay, and then um, Jim, I'm gonna let you come back on if you have something new to present. Um, do you have something new to add, Jim? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, okay. uh, first, I apologize for not uh, congratulating you and Anthony on your reelection. Congratulations. Uh, I just wanted to let you know I did it while we were on the on the call. Uh, someone did a quick Google search to see the facility in Fremont, California that was brought up before. That's the accelerator facility, the E-beam. Uh, according to um, Google Maps, it's about half a mile away from a residential area. And the other facility that it looks like is being built in Texas, which I'm not sure if that's within the scope or not, but that's still another, um, according to GPS, it's about uh, 300 feet. So I just wanted the board to be aware of the distance and proximity to this current facility that they're talking about. That's okay. all, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, so that concludes public comments. I think that concludes all of the emails that were received to add to the public record. Um, I assume that I think I caught everything. So if I didn't catch anything, I assume they'll be entered in as part of public record either way. Um, are there any more, are there any new questions from the board at this point? Not for me. Nope, okay. Um, any new information from the applicant at this point? Okay. I don't believe so, Madam Chair. Okay. I just, I did have some quick questions on the sound study. Sure. Um, the, do they account for, I'm assuming it would be all just relative, but winter versus summer sound acoustic differences? So, uh, yes, we do. Uh, when we took our baseline sound measurements, we took it uh, in, in March. So that, um, uh, allows us to capture some of the lowest sound levels that you would anticipate during the, during the year. Um, when you get into the spring and summer periods, uh, you tend to get more human activity and, and then there's also more insect activity as well, which help to contribute to elevate the sound levels. Now, if we had done the measurements during that time period, we would have corrected for that to uh, a lot of times we get a lot of cricket and other types of insect noise that help to elevate the background sound levels. Uh, but in this case, we were able to capture those ambient sound levels during, um, during the, during the um, March uh, time period, which is, you know, tends to be a, a quieter period of the time. Uh, with regards to our acoustic modeling, we do take into account uh, the fact that, um, you know, terrain and, and weather conditions as well. Okay. I guess one of my questions is that um, obviously in the winter time there are less trees, so sound does travel um, more noticeably. 
but also does it account for things like tree or vegetation removal by the project once it's done? Um, we, when we did our acoustic modeling for the project site, um, we, we did take into effect you know, the, the buildings that were gonna be, uh, the existing buildings as well as the future expansion of that. Um, with regards to foliage, um, you know, it, it would have to be a very densely wooded, wooded area for you to get any appreciable sound reduction. Okay. Um, if it's just a few trees that you're talking about, you're not gonna get any particular sound reduction uh, associated with that. Okay. That's it for me. Okay, um, question for the applicant. Oh, Amy, go ahead, go ahead. I just have one point to make, and um, this is just going back to the definition of light manufacturing. And um, I'm just wanted to make a point that I went back and looked at our definition. I have bylaws back to like 1955, but in 1986, light manufacturing didn't include the word radiation, but in um, 2008, it lists when they were amended. And after um, 1992, 11 9, 1992, the word radiation was added in to light manufacturing. So it looks like it was added into our definition after um, the original STARS. And as part of the de definition, it says any manufacturing or industrial use, storage, processing, fabrication, which would not be detrimental or offensive or tend to reduce property values. Oh, this was 2008. By reasons of dirt, glare, odor, fumes, smoke, gas, radiation, danger of explosion and fire. So I just wanted to make a note that before 1990, radiation wasn't included in the definition as a detriment and um, after 1992, it was. It was just a point I wanted to make. Okay. Other I have a question for the applicant about um, your thoughts on off-site versus on-site concrete plant, because we talked a lot about that, but I actually didn't hear like your opinion on that, which like it sounded like Kip thought either way would work, but is that something you have a preference over or just, just interested in your thoughts on that one? I don't know who answers that. Uh, Madam Chair, our preference would be to have the plant on site just for the um, quality, controlling the quality, um, like uh, Kip had mentioned. Um, but as he said, um, whether it's 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 off site or on site, um, we, we we could still get the job done. Okay. Um, and your reasons, go ahead, I'm sorry. I just... Can I just follow up on that? Sure, um, sure. So all along we've been talking about and having a lot of discussions about it being um, on site. So now we sort of opened it up and said, can we have it off site? And I think some of the information tonight was a little bit, we couldn't figure out how many trucks, the numbers of days. And so it was a little bit conflicting and so I will tell you personally, I am not in favor to an on-site. I'm in favor of an off-site. Um, I don't know how the other board members feel about it, but I'm in favor of that. And so I feel like if the board is leaning to that, then I feel like the applicant needs to go back and do some more work on what does that actually look like? Because most of the presentation to us has been, what does it look like for having something on-site? And, and I think that has also been off-site trucking it in during the normal business hours of seven to seven or whatever the, the board determines, seven to five, Monday through Friday. But anyways, what I was saying is the, the model that you've been showing for the past six or nine months has been on-site. And this is the first time we've really um, developed, gotten into what does an off-site look like versus an on-site. So I feel like to move forward with that, if the board feels like that's a better way to move forward, there'd be some more research that needs to be done, some more questions and answered, because I think the questions tonight, some of the answers just didn't work out as far as the number of trucks and stuff like that and what it would actually look like. 
Okay, so that doesn't impact my decision, but I don't know if other board members, if it impacts your decision. Um, I don't know, Amy, does that impact your decision? Um, I just have to think about it for a second. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, Millie, does that impact your decision? I, I would definitely like to see more information and the pros and cons to having it offsite. Okay, Anthony, does that impact your decision? No, I've come to a conclusion. Okay, Mich um, Amy, Michelle, that impacts your decision. Yeah, I just wanted to hear more information about it. Okay, Amy, does that impact your decision? No, not really, no. So if, if I just want the applicant to understand the benefits of going back to do all that research, if it's not going to impact any decisions, then it may not be a, um, a similar to what we've done in the past where we let the applicant know if it's going to make a difference or not. They can decide if they want to go and make that effort or not. So I guess I'd put up to the applicant, do you want to make that effort or not? Uh, we're, we're not interested in doing that. Okay. Okay, any other oh, new information? Oh, Ma Madam Chair, I will add, I, I think we're happy to try and clarify any questions related to the trucking. I do think um, that this is an issue that would be outside of the board's purview as it relates to um, a method of construction, which is not, um, which is not within the scope of, of uh, chapter 40A. But even having said that, um, we can try and clarify any, any misunderstanding that there might be with respect to um, the concrete plant versus having the trucks just bring the concrete to us and have the concrete mixed off site. Um, I think what you heard is that the, the number of trucks overall is not going to change appreciably, um, but we can, we can try and clarify that for you. Um, okay, it's just not going to impact anything. And as you mentioned, it's not really part of necessarily what we're looking at. So I don't know if that would be of any value. Um, I'm not confused about it, and it doesn't sound like a majority is. So um, I, I don't. I just, think can I just ask a question from, I forget who just answered the question. Is it that Steris does not want to as a board member, if I said, will you be willing to go off site? Are you saying we do not want to go off site? We're not willing to entertain that. I just, I just want a clarification that because I felt like what was coming from Dave and what was coming from, I forget who else answered was two different answers. No, we, we, we are willing to go off site. Um, we weren't willing to put together any information in terms of the difference between the two uh, being on site or off site because it's, it's, it's trucking in the, the concrete at that point. So I think we spoke to the number of trucks that that would be, be it on site or off site. I don't know what more there is to do to talk about what it would look like if the plant was off site. Um, it, it seems to me it eliminates the concerns of the neighbors at that point. Okay. Um, Mr. Janeski, you have something? Attorney Janeski, you, I see your hands up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to be sure that if the applicant through council is looking for the opportunity to present clarification on an issue uh, that the board spent a lot of time discussing this evening, I think that that opportunity should be given. Okay, I mean, I, I just wanna make sure you're not, because this has been going on so long and I know we're sensitive to it, I don't want to drag it on if that's not your preference to do so. So to that point, if it's something you want the opportunity to do, then Certainly you can. Is that what you're saying, Attorney Janeski, that they should have the opportunity to decline or accept? Yes, because that's what I'm hearing and it was obviously a point of great concern and discussion today, so. Yeah, I that's okay. Recommend you want that opportunity. Continue that discussion to its conclusion. Yeah. Okay. And, and Madam Chair, I guess I'd add to that, we're, we're happy to try and answer any questions that the board has that are that remain unclear. Um, but if the board members are saying that that, that doesn't matter, um, then, then I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> we're happy to try and answer the questions okay. however we can. I think what you were hearing from Mr. Corelli is that we don't know what additional information we could provide you with respect to um, concrete being mixed offsite and then brought to the site. It would be brought in trucks as, as you've, you've heard tonight. Okay, 
and before. Okay, Mich so Michelle, do you have anything, or Millie, you mentioned that you'd want more information. So I guess Millie and Michelle, are there, um, is there specific information to help guide or um, inform the applicant? What would be helpful? So you can go ahead, Millie. I, I was just looking for more of the pros and cons because I think that that's kind of what we were leaning towards with uh, as from respect with the neighbors and the residents, the impact on them. And I, I, I guess I think that the pros for the um, applicant have been brought forth to have it on site. And I just feel that the pros that, that those are almost more negatives for residents and, and most everybody else. Um, and so I guess I just the... know if I was missing something else uh, on the pros on having it offsite. Okay, so pros and cons that kind of looked at both sides of the coin. Anything else that you would be interested in? That's it. And, and Michelle, it sounds like more of a clarification on numbers for you. Is that what so, you're looking at? Um, the applicant gave us a concrete plan that we have here, right? Mm -hmm. That was all based on everything's on site. Okay. And I think it's fair to then ask the applicant to come back and give us a plan like he presented where it's off site. Okay. Because the math on the trips doesn't really add up like I was saying before. And I know it can get confusing trying to do it tonight, but. I think, think that's reasonable. Now, I understand that the applicant says we get a better quality material if we do it on site versus off site, which then my next thing would be like, so what are the measures in place? And we talked about um, the exterior, um, I'm trying to look at my notes, the the rater, the rate, the rate meters, the um, the bolt, um, I'm looking over right now what we're talking about, the env environmental disseminators all of those we were talking about, could we have those as a measure of um, having on the exterior of the building? And that was something that we're gonna ask the applicant about. We haven't had a chance until now. So I think it's reasonable to come back and say, okay, here's our plan. We've heard the concerns of the residents. Um, and then now what we're coming back with is here's what it would look like if it's exterior, here's what we could do for everything that's on the exterior of the building that we talked about some of those um, measuring guidelines. And then I think also uh, for some of the concerns, uh, uh, um, how, do we, how do we take a vote of confidence as far as the operations and the checks and balances for making sure that um, accidents don't happen? I, I understand what you're saying, that's more at a state level, but people have asked that tonight. So that's why I think it's reasonable to ask the applicant to come back and, sh and answer these questions again, because it was a lot of information. Okay, Michelle, just a clarification on one of your points. Um, you were talking about measurements on the exterior. Was that related to the concrete or the um, radiation? So what we talked about was some of the questions that the board members had, including yourself, was how do you know the life of the concrete, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you know if any radiation is 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 coming through the concrete? And how do you measure that? Okay, so outside. unrelated to the plant. I just wanted to make sure yeah. it was a different, that was a unrelated, different. Unrelated, yeah. It's the building itself, yes. Okay, so hearing those, anything, any, uh, anything else? Hearing those, is that something the applicant wants an opportunity to speak to, to think about and come back and speak to? So it's pros and cons, what, a, what it would look like offsite, um, clarifying some of the math on the trips. Um, Michelle had an initial question about um, just measuring on the exterior area, putting well, how we can do measurements there and um, checks, uh, how do we get a, to get a vote of confidence for checks and balances? Does that cover what everybody just said? So that's something the applicant wants an opportunity to speak to or any or all of those things? Madam Chair, this is uh, David Jackson. Hi, David. Uh, how you doing? Um, from the radiation monitoring standpoint, monitor, you know, setting up monitors on the exterior of the building, um, I would much prefer to leave that up to the experts with the radiation division of the Department of Public Health for Massachusetts, um, mm -hmm. either in consultation with you or in consultation with us. They 
they really are the experts for the state um, on what type of equipment you would even be looking for and whether that equipment makes sense in, in their opinion. Okay. So that's something you probably wouldn't be able to come back on out of those items. Yeah, right now I would prefer to leave that up to the state to make that decision as they're looking over the remainder of the application and all of the, the safety interlocks and the shield and everything else that they've got to review and inspect. Um, they'd be better informed to make a decision on that, I believe. Okay. Okay, so the, is this something you want the opportunity to come back and present? No, ma'am, not at this time. Thank you. Oh, okay. So for that component, do you want it, do you want anything related to the rest of it or no? From the radiation standpoint, I, I think I may have missed any other questions that were related to radiation. Oh no, they oh no, I think they are good there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, or, or maybe the only other thing would be just like, you know, what are the checks and balances? And I think that may actually be in the peer review a little bit, just in terms of was there something specific, Michelle, when you were talking about the checks and balances that you're looking for? Be, is it beyond what's in the peer review? What? Yeah, a lot of the checks and balances that go into that are the interlocks that again that the state requires in their regulations and that they would be reviewing prior to allowing construction to even start or giving us registration for the machines. Okay. So Michelle, did you have something else in mind for that? No. Okay. So it looks like basically we're looking at an opportunity to talk more about the offsite option. Did you want to present any information on, so right now we have pros and cons of impact on the neighbors and um, what it would look like, what that math looks like for, an, uh, you know, just breaking it down in a way that makes more sense because it sounds like there was some confusion over the numbers. Did you want to present that? Did you want the opportunity to present that? Uh, no, Madam Chair, yeah, we don't. Okay. Okay. And, uh, I, Madam Chair, I'll I'll just add that I that I think we we had um, presented that information through Kip earlier in the evening, um, specifically with respect to the to the differences between on site and off site. Obviously, on site was the preference, but if the board would rather have us do it off site, it's going to be roughly the same amount of trucks, um, and we'll have to do a little bit more planning. Um, and those trucks will come in a more condensed time period on those days that they're actually doing pours. But otherwise, um, you know, they're, they're kind of six and one half dozen of the other in terms of truck traffic. Okay. Um, okay. Why well, are you um, open to a condition of time? It sounded like you're open to a condition of time on the concrete plant. Well, actually the hours are seven to seven. So I guess it's not a condition at all. It's just following the actual construction hours. It sounds like that was, that seven o'clock was not a problem. The regular construction hours or the construction hours from the bylaws are not a problem. That was my understanding as well, Madam Chair. Um, Me too. Crowley can chime in if I've misunderstood that. No, that, that, that is correct. Okay, um, the, I guess that would be hard to condition. So it sounds like to put measure, any sort of measurement on the exterior walls. Um, so Attorney Janeski, question for you. If, if it's really up to the state about those exterior monitors, it doesn't seem like it would be a condition that we could place because we're not the ultimate authority on that monitoring system or device or anything. Is that correct? The state does have the priority and I would say superior monitoring authority. I, I suppose you could envision a condition that requires that that be addressed somehow in the applicant's information back to the town. And I, I think that's what I've heard from Mr. Jackson that they would want to defer on that. Okay, so is there any condition within our authority that would help to um, 
speak to that or would it just be a condition that wasn't even enforceable because we're not the overarching authority on that monitoring? I would recommend maybe asking the applicant more directly. You heard from the consultants who suggested two kinds of things, one uh, simpler and one more uh, elaborate uh, perhaps with the dosimeter and the rate meter. And I believe the comments were that a dosimeter would be a pretty low cost feature. So I guess I would say, put that question to the applicant, is that something they'd be willing to do? So David Jackson, is that your ball game? Is that something like that sort of monitoring system be something you would be willing to do? Or is it you still wanna hear from the state? I would actually want to discuss that with the state because those types of dosimeters um, I don't believe are designed for outside use. Okay. Um, you would want to consult with the state on, on their opinions on using something like that outside. And we'd, we'd actually want to consult with manufacturers also to find out the effects of, of general weather on, uh, on equipment such as that. It is, I, I agree with uh, with uh, your council that it is relatively low tech, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's it would be the proper response for what you're looking for. Okay. Um, board members, is there anything else we need to clarify or verify? Um, things that would have been conditions or thoughts of conditions that we need to make sure we understand is viable or not? I know going back to the very beginning today, I tried to go through all the documentation and there was a letter from the fire chief way back when, and he talked about putting a knock box on the fence so he could get in and out. Is that added in the site plan or we add that as a condition? And I don't know, I guess it would be great too for someone to pull up the latest site plan because certain things have changed. The, um, just to answer that, question about the Knox box. That's just something that is standard as part of the building permit review with the building department and the fire chief. So that's, okay. that's on just about every building. In there. All right, he had it on our memo. I just want to read it. He had that and he talked about fire flow tests and alarm systems. That would be part of the building, I'm assuming. And he talked about the churning radius. So those were the only three things from the fire department. Okay, and so it sounds like that box is covered. Kathy, is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, that, it, that's a pretty standard requirement from the fire department. Okay, all right, then it sounds like um, that is there any further information, any new or different information from the applicant? I don't believe so, Madam Chair. Okay, great. Then I will entertain a motion to close the hearing. I make a motion to close the hearing. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Uh, Millie? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Amy? Aye. Michelle? Aye. And carries an aye. Okay, the hearing is closed. So Jim, I'm gonna have you remove our panelists. Not a problem Thank again, you. just take one moment. Okay, all right, thanks everybody for coming and answering all these questions. Thank you, happy to do it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. to do this. All right, and I believe that is it for the representatives. Okay, great. 
Um, okay, so I think as a board, we need to figure out, um, you know, obviously we have to deliberate this. We have um, another hearing we have to attend to. What, what are our options for, do we have to deliberate and make a decision this evening? Are we prepared to do that at this hour? Do we need to get to the next hearing? Any thoughts from board members on this? I think we can do it either way, but it's up to the board. You know, it is 946. Do you want to deliberate and close? I mean, we already closed. Or do you want to, I think we can vote at the next meeting, but it's up to everybody else. I don't know. Do we go on to one Lyman? Are we able to, what's the, Attorney Janeski, can, can we put this on the agenda and deliberate at our next hearing? Because it's as we enter a five hour marathon, I think it's a lot to, if we need to deliberate quite a bit or. Yes, you can have a meeting scheduled for the purpose of deliberation. It's just our, as, as part of our regular course of um, planning board agenda, not a separate meeting, correct? Right, it can be on an agenda with other items. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, how does the board feel about that? I'm, I'm at the tail end of... And, and in <laughs> fact, I, I would recommend that with all the information you've received today, some of it just arriving today, that if you're going to deliberate, that you do it after you've all had a chance to review that information. Okay. I, agree. I would agree. I agree, because some of the consultants even had comments about conditions, and it would be go back good to go back and read it all. Okay. So uh, what I wanna do quick, really quickly is just take just a two, five minute break for any board members that need to just take a really quick break because we obviously have one line in, coming up and we've been doing this now for five hours. So um, I'd like to, do I need to make a motion to take a five minute break? You may declare it, Madam Chair. I declare. That's, that's within your purview. <laughs> I declare a five minute break. Um, and Jim, I don't know if you just leave this going or, or whatever the case, but I'm going to put mine on uh, mine on stop video. And Absolutely. We'll with, yeah, uh, so I will. Uh, so the live stream will be continuing. Um, so I, I believe if you would like, you can uh, pause your stop your video and mute your mics uh, while you are away. OK, so at 9.53, we will resume. Mm.
All right, everyone all revved up, Kerry? We're revved up. <laughs> I think I could hear someone microwaving something, so. Who is? Someone is microwaving. Were you microwaving? Uh, no, I just ate a granola bar. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we almost have everybody back. Just Michelle and Millie, then we'll get started. Carrie, after you do the, the hearing, I just have three quick, real quick things. Um, okay, sure. Two for your possible, uh, and possibly for your June 1st agenda. Okay, sure. Um, just requests from people. Okay. Um, so let's see, we have, Millie, are you there? Or Michelle, are you there? No. I'm here. Michelle. Okay, we have Michelle back. Sorry, I'm here. Okay. okay, everybody is back. Kathy's back, Fred's back. We have Millie, Michelle, Anthony, Carrie. Okay, great. Um, thanks everybody for taking a little break here. Um, I'd like to start the continued public hearing for One Lyman Street. So Jim, if you wanna bring in One Lyman Street and the uh, applicant for One Lyman Street. Hi, hi everybody, good evening. Thanks for sticking in. I'm sure you learned quite a bit this evening. Okay, great. Um, getting started, um, in terms of new information, it looks like we had a new drawing sent in today for that turn. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, or if there's other stuff that you wanted, additional information you wanted to cover. I think design review you finished up with. Um, so I'll leave it to you. Um, Attorney Gould, do you want to set, set the table? Sure, I'd be like happy to. Sure. Uh, first of all, congratulations to you and Anthony on the re-election. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Makes for late nights for you, but... Um, so I heard from Vito that he had heard from Fred Litchfield that the police chief may have had a couple of comments concerning the uh, traffic exit on Lyman Street. And it was a question that the chief wanted to make sure that there was an adequate turning range so that anybody coming out onto Lyman Street and turning towards Bartlett would not have to cross the line on Lyman Street. Mm -hmm. So what, what the chief suggested and what Vito has done is he's used the WB55 design vehicle, which will cover the largest tractor, trailer, truck, uh, so that it can come out of that exit and what he basically did was widened the mouth coming into Lyman Street so that the truck can now come out and not have to cross that center line. Other than that, everything is the same. Okay. Any oh, I take it back. There was one other thing. The chief did want to, or he suggested that we put a sign there saying 
as it would face Lyman Street saying uh, exit only and not a through way so that people would not uh, try to go in there to avoid the stop sign at Bartlett Street. So mm -hmm. those are the two things that we have agreed to and they are shown on this plan and the signs will be part and you can make it a condition um, of the decision that one would say not a through way and the other would say exit only. Okay. Any board questions on this? I have one. Um, sure. And I'm sure there's probably a well, obvious reason here, but I'm just curious why, what was the reason that the, the, the exit for and the, the loading dock is facing Lyman Street and not Bartlett? Um, I can respond to that, Marshall, if you like. Okay. Um, sure. Just the, there's, I don't know if I can probably share my screen on the other. Oh, yeah, I'm uh, sorry. Sure. Hold on. Okay. Go ahead. I can just show this, uh, show the site plan. Um, okay. So, um, because of the, the wetland resources over here, um, there's this angle on this side of the parking area. If we were to flip the dock, you know, almost mirror image and have the trucks come this way, um, we don't have that space on this end that we do over in here. It just gets pinched down um, over in here. Um, you know, this, this side has the more favorable area to provide the turning maneuvers you need for that truck uh, size. So we did look at, you know, coming in the opposite way. Uh, we just couldn't fit that truck to be able to get back in and around and out. Um, you know, if it was the dock would be about here and the end of the truck, the face of the truck would be sitting out here um, before it could turn out. Over here, we can use this whole area uh, for that turning uh, maneuver. That's all. Okay. I assumed there was some dimensional uh, limitation. Yep. Okay. But is it um, following up on that? Sorry, Anthony, did I cut you off? Do you have another question? No. no. Is it impossible to, let, even if you didn't face the dock, to just get out the other way? Or um, if, if you put a a large, you know, a turnout down this way and you did like a three point turn uh, with the truck. Uh, it's not ideal at all for a truck maneuvers to kind of make that maneuver and we'd have to pave out an apron. You know, if you wanted to come out of here and pull up back down and then try to turn around, um, you know, it's not a ideal move at all for a truck uh, and it would create more pavement area down in here. Uh, to try to get a truck to go back out to Bartlett Street. Okay. Is that only in the case of an 18-wheeler, or is that like all sizes of trucks would have trouble? Uh, smaller vehicles could turn around, uh, you know, in here. Uh, the 18-wheeler, that's the one that can't, you know, it just I needs that much that. space to get around. But a smaller truck, you know, you could probably pull it right around in here almost, um, you know, and pull a circle and just go back out. Okay. Other questions here? When, when did that um, plan come out? Uh, the one with this, I just sent it in earlier today with this uh, okay. radius I change. Yeah. It. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it just changes this. Before this came out, kind of their mirror image, and we kind of just cut off this end. So when the back end of the truck comes around, yeah, um, it just drags over this portion right in here. Right. Uh, that just helps us keep on this side of the road. Um, yeah. I did not see that. That's the only change on the site plan. Okay. So okay. through the chair, uh, would you like me to proceed or do you want to ask questions of the board first? No, if you have something you want to present, go right ahead. Sure. Okay. So can I when... just ask one question? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Can, just, can you just point out how the trucks pack back up to that truck bay while you had it up? Like, do they pull in off Bartlett Street? Yep. And then... Yeah, so they come in, they'll come in this way, kind of just pull up to right here and then back up. But so they're not with this kind of. Into the road? No, do they they'd. Into the road to back up? No, they'd be up and maybe right about here. Um, there's plenty of distance. So that's why at this angle, it really helps because um, you're almost kind of pulling up and then just backing up right into it. You don't have to do a big 
turning maneuver to get, you're not even going 90 degrees to get in. It's almost just a go up and back in. And then when they're done, they just pull out. Yeah. So when they pull out, they can just pull straight out and, you know, hook around the corner. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay. So through the chair, shall I proceed? Please do. Okay. Thank you. So when we uh, left the last planning board meeting about four weeks ago, we had, I just want to review what we have covered and what we have not covered. Uh, so we have covered the site plan and the engineering subject to this one change that the police chief requested. We have covered the amount of traffic coming to and exiting this site, including deliveries by the Postal Service and by UPS. We covered the type of product and the style of the warehouse in the sense that it is not your typical warehouse with power forklifts and uh, many warehouse workers. It is, uh, we covered the hours of operation that standard hours are nine to six, uh, but that some of the employees come in an hour early and the UPS typically might come if they're a little bit late, um, that employees have to stay there until that load is sent out or at least one employee has to stay. We've uh, covered the fact that there is one residential abutter. Uh, we have sent three emails offering to meet with that abutter. Um, we did get an email back saying that it was not possible to meet, that there were some personal things going on that uh, they were not able to give us time to meet with them. Uh, the town planner presented that the question that was raised early at a planning board meeting, that the type of packaging that is done at this warehouse uh, does not make it light manufacturing. And that was supported by both the town planner and the building inspector. Uh, we said in the application, and we will repeat now, that we will still need a demolition permit, an earth removal permit, and from the Conservation Commission, an order of conditions. We have had five meetings with the Design Review Committee. The letter that I saw actually refers to four, but there have actually been five meetings um, with Design Review. And there was a lot of input and back and forth on the building appearance and landscaping as the two greatest points of discussion. Uh, there was also discussion about sign, lighting, loading dock, color, size, grade of the building. Uh, the summary was that everybody on the design review committee felt it was a very well-designed project. And in fact, uh, several of the people, including the two architects, said it's going to be the best looking building in the area and a significant upgrade over all the other buildings in the area. They were also uh, part of multiple conversations about the landscaping. So the, the building design and the landscaping is what uh, we had continued this hearing to present to the planning board tonight. And lastly, we had reviewed uh, based on information from the building inspector and, and the assessor's office, other industrial buildings on Bartlett Street and Lyman Street and determined that right now there's about a million and a half square feet, uh, excuse me, of industrial space and included in those buildings are literally hundreds and hundreds of loading docks and the operations are much longer hours than what this business of cable matters would be at this site that's only gonna have one loading dock. During the process with design review, we uh, went from two loading docks to one loading dock because it was determined that uh, by the owner that we really don't need it. And right now, just as a reminder, where he is now, he's getting one tractor trailer delivery about every three months. And in this case, he's gonna be uh, making the building larger, 
And even though he has the same number of employees that he's had for the last five years, it is hoped that he will double the capacity, which would double the deliveries that would make it once roughly every six weeks. So every one to two months, one tractor trailer, the rest of the deliveries uh, to Cable Matters are all by either a small postal truck or a UPS that would also deliver to homes or businesses, but small businesses. That's where we were at. Um, today, we'd like to share the screen with you and show you the building design. And I know that we have Kathy Jubert and Michelle Gillespie were both part of the design review committee as were, oh, by the way, I didn't introduce the people who were here. It's the same people who have been here before. So obviously we've already heard from Vito Colon, but we have Alok Danda, who is our architect on this project. We have David Verin, who is the landscape architect and will be doing landscaping. And of course the proposed owner of the property and the owner of Cable Matters, Jeff Jiang. So forgive me for not introducing them at the beginning. Um, I'm not sure whether it is Kathy or Alok or who wants to share the designs that were approved by design review committee. Is it going to be you, Jeff, or is it going to be? Yeah, I can, I can share. Alok? Okay, why don't we do that? <clears throat> so the first screen that you see here without all the landscaping in front of it, Jeff, let's go back to that first screen. So that's the loading dock. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Which way you want to start? You can start right here as long as okay. you sure. So this will be the front of the building facing Bartlett Street. And people will drive in on the driveway that you see there coming in from your right as you look at this. And the parking spaces will be along the left side of the building. This does not show the lined parking spaces but all the parking is going to be on that left-hand side of the building, which is the industrial side, uh, industrial zone side of the building, as opposed to putting it on the residential side of the building. Want to go to the next one, Jeff? That is, well, Jeff, this is not the latest one. This is the one that is showing the residential side. So that's not the most recent one. I don't know if you have it or if Dave has it. Okay, uh, Jeff, go back one screen, please. Okay, so this is the landscape plan that David came up with. So from Bartlett Street, this is what you will see. You see there on the rounded corner coming in from Bartlett, there is a sign there. It is not a large imposing sign. Uh, and that says cable matters. And that's going to be the only monument sign at the building. And you can see that there's an awful lot of landscaping, I think quite a bit more than most office buildings and probably even homes, uh, but certainly more than we see in any of the other industrial buildings in town. Mm -hmm. One of the comments that was made at the design review is this is the fifth rendition of that building and they, in the design review, they actually said, some of them said it looks almost like an office building or a classroom building in a campus, as opposed to a warehouse. Jeff, do you wanna to go to the next slide, please? Okay, this shows also the front as you get a little closer to the building, you'll see some grass and plantings on the side facing east as well as in the front of the building facing north. Next one, Jeff. You can also notice from this that the building, instead of being all one cement colored building uh, with no windows on the side that would clearly look like a warehouse, uh, through the efforts of our architect and the design review, they came up with this design uh, and they felt like it was a much more attractive building, does not look like a warehouse. 
The building that you see here faces the residential abutter on Lyman Street. Uh, that would be Stone and Beckstrom. And we had several landscape plans to show the design review committee, including some that completely blocked the view of the building. Michelle or Kathy may want to talk more about it, but the comments from the people in the design review were, it's an extremely attractive building, don't hide it with trees and give the trees and the grass room to grow. If you plant too many trees there, you'll be blocking the light and you won't have healthy grass and you probably won't have as healthy trees. So this was the uh, landscape view that Dave came up with that the board felt was a better design of both the building and the landscaping. In fact, Michelle, at the last design review, asked the board whether we should present both plans to the planning board, but it was unanimous in the design review that they felt that these trees, as they would broaden out, would be much better looking and healthier and allow for better, healthier landscaping than the other plan that had a lot more trees there. We did, as a result of that, contact the people across the street and asked if we and our landscaper could meet with them in case they wanted to give their input and in case they wanted us to put any additional landscaping on their property. That meeting did not take place, but there were three emails offering to do so. Jeff, you wanna to go to the next slide? This is from Bartlett Street, which you've pretty much seen, except you didn't see the right hand corner of the front of the building. Keep going, Jeff. Okay, and this is as if you are coming up the coming up Lyman Street towards Bartlett. What you do not see here. Oh, I'm sorry. This is if you're driving down Bartlett Street. I apologize. Go to the next one, Jeff. This is, if you're coming down Lyman Street, that's the rear of the building facing south, and that's the single loading dock reduced from two loading docks. And you can see that there is going to be a fair amount of landscaping, and we are still willing, if the abutter wants, to put more landscaping to block any view of the loading dock but this is the one that design review felt was best. Go ahead, Jeff. All right, and this is what you'll see as you're driving down. If you're not looking directly in the exit, and I can see that they put the exit only sign there, but as you drive down, that's the view you're gonna have of the landscaping and the building. Keep going, Jeff. All right, and then this is just the shape of the building with the lower section being Bartlett Street and on the right, it's Lyman Street. Is that it, Jeff, or do you have any more there? Uh, I don't. So okay, that's it. so I think that's pretty much it. I don't know uh, how you wanna deal with this, uh, Madam Chairman, but I don't know if you want either Michelle or Kathy to speak about design review or whether you just want to proceed based on the letter that they had given. So Michelle or Kathy, you're welcome to say anything if you'd like. But I know we got the letter that said a design review, gave it a thumbs up. Do you have anything you want to add or? No, I think um, when you looked at the original rendering to what you had now, it's significantly different. I mean, I think it's a nice transition from a residential into the industrial. As I've talked before, it's hard to make that transition. Um, and I think they've been done great work on the building to make it uh, transition nicely from uh, one zone to the other. Um, with the landscape design, I think it's an excellent design. There are two rows of trees um, and we didn't wanna take away from the aesthetics of the building. 
Um, if you, I don't know whether Marshall had presented both the um, plans, but when we filled it all with trees, it actually did not look good. And I think uh, Dave Veron, who could probably talk about how when you do that, there's a lot of overgrowth and the trees end up dying. So we thought, you know, the, the, what we had done with the landscape plan right now had looked good and, I, and it complemented what, you know, the attractiveness of the building. Um, so we worked quite a lot and I, I compliment um, Jeff and his team. They worked well with us. And um, like I've said before, it's really unusual to find an applicant who is going to put in such mature trees so that when they go in, they actually look like they've been growing there for upwards of 10 years. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I commend Jeff on that. That was a great investment. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it looks really good. I, I, I like the whole look of the building and, you know, you guys can decide and see whether you like what we produced or not. But like I've always said to the board, it's difficult that first building that you have to transition from residential to industrial, but I think we did a good job on making that transition. Okay, thank you. Dave, did you, David, did you want to add anything from a landscaping perspective? I think, uh, you know, it's pretty much uh, what you see in those photos. Everything there is very large scale. It's going to be 20 foot plus as far as a lot of the trees, uh, larger stuff, uh, which is very large scale material. And um, you know, provided you guys like it, I think it looks pretty good. So um, the tree height, it's 20 feet. So it doesn't actually meet the roof height. It's a little shorter than the roof. How tall is the building? The building will be about 30 feet, but from perspective, it will. I mean, more often than not, I, I understand if you're on the second floor of a house, you know, with, with straight line of sight, it may not block the very top of the building, but anybody at pedestrian level, you know, ground floor level, it'll, it'll, it'll block it. And these trees are coming in at 20 plus. So it's not 20 on the nose, it's oh, 20 okay. plus. So, uh, you know, I have to go up and tag them and, and pick them and all that. So they will be 20 feet plus. So what the plus is, is not exactly sure. But okay. it will be over 20. Okay. Um, questions from the board on any of this? Amy? So are all the trees to scale on the pictures? Like not just the, um, the green trees, but are those maples, the other ones? They're going to be as close as I can get them. Okay. I was just curious if it was just one tree that was larger. They're all pretty much the scale, like when we look at the picture. As close as we're able to get them, yes. Okay. Thanks. Just to follow up on that, Amy, we made it a point that on the Lyman Street side, we wanted the bigger trees. Some of the other landscape and flowering trees are not gonna be that big right near the building uh, in the front, for example, as you look at it from Bartlett Street, but the trees are all gonna be much larger than you'd see in front of a typical new building. Put it this way, the, the trees we're getting, you're not getting out of any local nursery around here. These things have been sourced. They're coming from upstate New York. These things are gonna be coming in 18 wheelers, not one, but probably close to 15 to 20, 18 wheelers to come in for this one property, if not more. Mm -hmm. Very atypical. You would not find that in any planting, you know, going on normally at all. Are they, um, are they maples? What, what are they? Yeah, it's going to be exactly to what's on the uh, spec sheet to what's called out. It'll be exactly the same thing that's being called out on the plans. Okay. Um, I just want, there was a, an abutter that sent in a, some questions. I just wanted to get cover them because I had, I think that some of them are really good questions. Just in terms of, it looks like the, there's faux wood metal panels. Is there anything, any concerns there with heat or light reflective or glare or corrosive rust rot? Like, is there anything to be concerned? That's not a material that I know much about. So if any um, thoughts on that or how that is different than yeah, yours. There's, there's no real concern. We use them on, on uh, you know, more, more commercial office um, type projects all the time. They're used in institutional jobs all the time. You know, the side facing Lyman Street has got a limited amount. It's interspersed with split face CMU block in front of which we've planted uh, 
trees. So you have the, the metal panel, which has got penetrations for the windows. Then you have some split face CMU block, which is light in color with some light banding in the trees and then a repeated pattern. Um, so there's not a ton of it in the first place. Second, no, they're aluminum metal panels. They're made by very reputable companies. They have, you know, 15 year, 20 year warranties on them like roofs. They're not going anywhere. I mean, your most, most siding on houses is going to rot, you know, rot out the way before these. Plus, they don't require any real maintenance. There's no painting of these panels, etc. cetera. The, uh, the images of the wood grain, et cetera, and the colors are baked into these, these metal panels. So they're not, they're not going anywhere. Okay. And then, um, Dave, for you about the landscaping. So in terms of what's there, what will still be there in the winter, if we could just look at it quickly at one of the renderings together, or I can bring, bring one up or if you, if you guys have one handy, I think you had a, oops. Okay, so if we were to look at this in the winter time, out of the types of trees that we've picked or whatever the case, what does this look like in the winter? Are we, are we still seeing foliage here? Or are these all branches? Uh, those are all, these are deciduous trees right there. You'll see branches. Just branches, no, so the, all the leaves will be gone win, winter time. Right, when, when we're going through the previous, we had evergreens in there. And it was by unanimous decision that that was not the best fit for this project right here on this side and on the other sides. Okay. Any specific reason why or? Uh, we had, that was one of the other plans. We had two plans drawn up that I did and the, they had this one and we had the other one. And as was addressed by Michelle when she was talking with what we did through uh, when design review was looking at this, the lack of light and the limitation long-term and the viability was not gonna be as good and it didn't look as good as this plan. And during the winter here, this would look, you know, it's gonna fill in quite well here. And when you look at the two plans side by side, if you have the other one, we can pull it up. You'll see the difference. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in this scenario, the evergreens would stay there, but the other, all the other trees would just have branches in the winter. That is correct. Okay. But over time, this is going to get so dense, you're going to start losing the lawn, and then these evergreens are eventually going to go into decline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for for the loading dock area, um, is, the, is will the dumpster also be located in that same area, or where is the dumpster on the site plan? Sarah is muted. Uh, the dumpster is in the corner of the parking area. Uh, we showed it with the screen, uh, fence screen around the outside. Oh, okay. Uh, yep, right there. Uh, okay, so it's not like by where the, so the area where the loading dock is obviously fades, faces out into the open. Just in terms of like, what would typically be out there? Would it be clean? Or are we looking at like a situation where there's pallets stacked up all over the place? Or what do we expect for how, you know, uh, we, we don't slow the pallets to the uh, dump so that we never did. So we usually call the uh, uh, a company to recycle them like once uh, six months or, you know, it depends on how many uh, we, we accumulate in the, uh, in the warehouse. So no, I mean, it's most likely it's the, oh, we are using the dumpster just to connect the uh, the cardboards. And oh yeah, but I just mean in front of the loading dock, like, I don't know if the trucks leave whatever they pick up or leave, if there'd be an instance where right around the loading dock would just have a whole bunch of, you know, discarded pallets or boxes or anything like that. I'm just wondering, you know, looks wise, as you look into there, there's nothing really blocking it. So I just wouldn't want it to be covered in, you know, a pile of pallets or discards. Yeah, we don't leave the parrots or the goods uh, outside the building. And uh, okay. so everything will be delivered into the uh, warehouse. Okay. Um, in terms of what's not being disturbed for current area, I don't think, um, is there any sense of, I think there are some trees over here. I mean, I'm looking right along the, you can't see my cursor, so I guess it's difficult to, uh, to try to express this, but 
are there, will the area beyond this perimeter here, I think you said at the last meeting, that's not going to be cut down, it'll be left alone outside of the dotted line, is that correct? The first yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So that whole left side of the page, um, that would all be left natural. Okay, so that's where some of the tr big trees <coughs> are and those will all be left. Mm -hmm. Okay, about how many trees are we, cut are there any of the big trees that are coming down for this or are they off to the side there? Um, I didn't inventory all the trees. I think the couple larger ones are more right in the center. Okay. Um, but um, I know right in that, where the, say where the detention basin is, uh, there was some trees in there. I don't think there's anything that's, you know, overly large, but there are mature trees in there. Okay. Um, I think there were some invasives throughout that area too. Okay. Um, but no real way to minimize that based on what you're just, you're only cutting what you need to. There's not. Yeah, we went up. That's the limit of work. We held it tight to the edge of grading. And then as soon as we get out of there, everything else gets protected. Okay, and what is in front of, is there a fence, for the infiltration basin, is there, is there a screening there or a fence there? Or what's in front of that facing um, one? That was just, um, just gonna be grass. Um, you know, it's just a grass shallow area. It's only, I think it's only about two feet deep. Um, so it's just a, a grassy area um, and that's all. So it's not a deep uh, pond or anything like that. It's just a, you know, a, ta a two foot deep, um, shallow uh, basin area. Uh, it should drain out um, within a day or less after a rain event. Uh, so it's not something that's gonna really hold water and become a kind of a, a swamp over there. Um, so it's more just a grass area. Okay, and other board questions? Um, one thing I do actually, I don't think attorney Dineski is still on here, is he? No, I think he left. No, he's, he's not Carrie. And I'm, I'm sorry if you. No, no, no problem. I was just on, on the off chance he was still here. I, I had a question and maybe I guess it could be a follow up to this. So um, along the lines of what Michelle said earlier, I think you've gone to great lengths to try to work and make this the best case scenario possible in the area that you're in. And, you know, I think as a board, we've said it would be nice to have developers try to work with us more because it makes it, um, you know, easier for us to when we get to meet in the middle and, and come together like that. So I really appreciate those efforts that you took um, specifically through the design review process to make that look better. My concern is that, um, you know, right now you have an appeal for a variance in the um, land court and that may take a couple of years. So, what I'd be afraid of is if we have one thing presented now that looks really nice and then in the interim, either a new tenant comes in or a new plan. So what I wanted to ask town council is about if we had a special permit that ran with, could a special permit run with a tenant if the, ten, the tenant's not the owner? It sounds like right now, um, Jeff is not the owner. That is correct, Kerry. Uh, if successful in the appeal and if successful in this decision as well as the demolition permit the concom and the earth removal permit then jeff will buy the property okay so i guess my question for council would be um, can a special permit run with a tenant not an owner Kathy, do you want to answer that? Or you want is that, to... Do you already know the answer to that? Uh, well, I know um, at times the ZBA um, with a special permit has specifically um, had it with the, with the applicant um, because, they, because that's the you know, business that they reviewed and that's the business that they mm. you know, approved to go in that location. So I don't see how that would be any different for the planning board because a special permit is a special permit, whether right. you know, it doesn't matter which board. Um, but I can certainly, you know, verify that with um, town council. Well, I'm just wondering because a lot of times the applicant is the owner. I mean, sometimes it doesn't have to be, but it, was that just the case because the applicant was the owner or is it just the applicant, whether you're the owner or the tenant makes no difference would only be my only like clarification. Well, I mean, mo most times, um, the the applicant 
is not the owner of the property because okay. you know the purchase and sale is contingent on on that applicant receiving all of their necessary permits okay so and if they don't receive their permits they're not going to go through with the sale of the property got it with the purchase of the property and carrie so, if i could add on that uh going to the zba on the variance for groundwater uh, we spent quite a bit of time with the ZBA like we did in the early hearing with this planning board to explain the products that Cable Matters sells. If anybody other than Cable Matters were to be there with different products, they would certainly have to go back under groundwater if the use changes. And so you could make it a condition, especially since it's in the groundwater, that if the products uh, change significantly and are no longer what we call computer or cable modem connectivity products uh, that they come back. Uh, we don't have a problem with that. So I don't think we can condition that. That's not our permit. Right. The, the, all, the, the issue with that, um, Marshall, is that um, this board is not issuing a special permit for the groundwater. That right. special that they would have to go back to the ZBA. But they never did a they never did a condition that you'd have to come back. It went with the land or variance goes with the land anyway. So correct. Okay. Okay, it's really late. I want to make sure I have um, let the public comment unless board members have additional comments or questions. Um, just because I know they've been waiting super long, so I want to give them the opportunity. Um, do board members have anything else at this point? Okay. Okay, so I have um, two hands raised right now. I'm going to pull one in. Um, John Wickstead. I'm going to unmute you. Just your name and address. Hi, um, John Wickstead, two Stir Brooklyn. Uh, in the interest of time, um, both for the applicant and the board, I'll try and keep my comments brief. You know, it's entirely possible that the use will change, here, you know, for two reasons. First of all, you know, it's a lengthy process to get this in. And second of all, there's, you know, there's nothing to say that in five years or 10 years or 15 years now, uh, you know, Cable Matters will, you know, maybe have expanded beyond this and the building will get sold to somebody else. And the idea that we're only going to have a truck once every six to 12 weeks is really inaccurate. Uh, we have no idea how many trucks we're going to have coming in and out of this thing because we don't know who's going to own the building in five years. This is a this is 17,000 square feet of warehouse space. And I completely respect uh, Mr. Zhang's intention to use it the way he says he does. I, I believe him entirely. I just think we don't know who's gonna own the building in five years or 10 years. And if the building gets sold and the use changes, that's gonna have significant detrimental effect to the residential neighborhood. Um, second of all, I would point out that the backup beepers will be primarily reflected by a 30 foot wall that is pointing directly at a residential home. Um, those backup beepers, every time the truck backs up, is going to reflect right off the back of that 30-foot wall and reflect directly into Ann Stone's kitchen. Um, second of all, the lights from the trucks that are exiting that building are going to be at about, you know, six foot, eight foot high, as 18-wheeler truck lights are, and they're going to sweep right across Ann Stone's kitchen every time they take a right-hand turn to get back out to Bartlett Street. And there's no way to change that short of making the trucks enter and exit out of Bartlett Street. But the way the plan currently stands, you know, the, the noise and the lights are going to disproportionately affect the residential neighborhood there. Um, I, I would say also that the renderings here are a little bit misleading. And I would encourage the board to take a look on Google Maps coming from Lyman Street to Bartlett Street. And if you look on Google Maps, you'll see how close the existing structure is. And if you look at the site plan that the candidate has provided, you can see exactly where this 30 foot wall building is gonna be. It's right on the back edge of that existing house. It is right up close to the road and the renderings make it look like it's gonna be pretty far away and it's not. If you look on Google Maps, you'll get a much better sense than if you look on the renderings that they've provided. The last point I would make on the renderings is that they've surrounded the building on its perimeter with lots of landscaping. In reality, this building site is surrounded 
particularly on the east side, by another large industrial complex. And if you look at their site rendering, their parking lot backs directly up onto another industrial building. And their site renderings make it look like it's going to be, you know, where we're going to have, you know, pixie running through the woods. Not the case. That's another industrial building right behind there. Um, and I would say also that when you look at the renderings from the Bartlett side, they've left Ann Stone's house out of it. So you never really get a sense of how the residential homes in this area interact with the building. And, and I think if they're going to provide us with renderings, they ought to be accurate. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And then um, I have Ann Backstrom. I'm going to bring you on. Just your name and address. Hi, this is Ann Dextra, 152 Bartlett Street. And um, you've answered a lot of the questions that I had already, but I have a couple more. Um, can you give me perspective on how tall the proposed building is at 34 feet versus the existing house and barn? Like, is it the same height as the house or higher, lower or, or what? Because I don't really know how tall those buildings are. So any sense on the height difference there? I don't know if that's for, you know, is that you that would know that? Um, I'm not sure the existing height of the house right now. Um, I'm just trying to look at the house right now on street view. Um, you know, houses are typically in that 30 foot range. It's a Cape style house. So it's got a 12 pitch roof, um, you know, with a story and a half on the second floor. So it's, it's it probably, that house is probably in the range of 30 feet ish, um, you know, right in there. Okay. So it's uh, lower than that, uh, larger barn, but about the same as the house. Probably around the house. It might be a little taller than the existing house now. Okay, um, the barn you. looks like it's pretty tall in the background. Um, right. You know, I don't have I don't have an exact number on the existing house though. Uh, I'm just trying to think right. off what a typical Cape style one and a half story is. Okay, I was just trying to give myself um, the perspective of that size of a yep. building. You know, the, how massive it actually will be. Yep. Um, and then, can you confirm the building square footage has it changed off of the original um i think you were talking about twenty thousand square feet but i thought i heard that had been revised a little bit in one of the meetings yeah all it was is the the footprint changed a little because of the um bump outs where those panels are uh, so those bump outs you know the inside interior dimensions haven't changed it's just when we added those panels uh, on the outside, it actually added some square footage of actual footprint of building, uh, but it's just architectural uh, bump outs of panels. Okay, so do you know what it is? Uh, the interior is 20,000 square feet. Uh, the exterior? Yes. The exterior is 20,230 something-ish. Uh, it's right around there. We can pull up that plan. I'm just trying to pull it off memory. Uh, Jeff had the first floor layout plan up earlier. Uh, we could pull that up. I think it was 20,232, if I can remember, but we should probably pull that plan up uh, if you need an exact number. Okay. Yeah, I would like that. Thank you. Um, and then, um, let's see, what was I going to ask? Oh, so um, in one of the prior meetings, you explained very quickly the 100 foot setback rules, but mm -hmm. um, I wondered if you could slowly walk me through that so from the wall it's sure. facing lyman street so that was 51.9 to the curb uh it was to the right away line to the property line i could, if i pull up the plan yeah, i could probably show you line. that'd be great yep because i'm having board trouble board those okay and you know Oops. you said lyman was 24 Sorry. feet so okay so so the 100 foot setback is from this side of Lyman Street, right here. Uh, Lyman Street itself is 60 feet wide. I can't see your cursor. I thought oh, you I said it was only. I thought you said it was 24 feet. Oops, uh, my share screen just got lost. And Hold just on. to clarify, the paved width of Lyman is 24 feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. The right of way of Lyman um, is 60 feet. Yep. So you're a little hard to hear, Marshall. Oh, yeah, so the, the, what Marshall is saying, the pavement itself is 24 feet wide, but the actual right-of-way, uh, the town 
right of way is 60 feet wide. So there's 18 feet on either side of the road itself. Yeah, I think on your side, there's 15 ish on project side, there's almost 20. So, okay. but it varies. The road kind of meanders through that 60 feet. Um, so from the opposite side of your, I guess your side of Lyman street, uh, the building has to be at least a hundred feet away. Uh, right now we're at 110 feet uh, from your so, property line. So going 15 feet into our property line. Uh, no, up to your property line. Um, so it's a, we're 110 feet from your, from your property line abutting Lyman. Um, so that, so that's the, the hundred foot setback is from that side of Lyman street. Okay. Um, do you see that, Ann? Do you see where he's pointing to? Yeah. Yeah, I see, but it's, it's hard for me because I see our driveway. I guess that's the driveway going in. Yeah. So, and then it yeah. looks like it's well in from that, like 18. Right. Know, right. Yeah. In. You, cause yeah, you don't own all the way up to the pavement line. Right. The actual property line is back another, Fifth. yeah, like you say, 15, 18 wow. feet. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, right. so that's an easement? That first 15 feet is an easement? Um, it's just part of the town land. It's, oh, okay. it's just the right of way, the public way. So that would, that would leave about 10 feet up to the house from there. Okay. Um, so then I think I just wanted to double check on something you said in the previous meeting that you were expecting to use 800 gallons of water per day. Did I misunderstand you? That was just for the um, septic system design. We have to, by the regulations, we have to design things by just a generic category. Uh, it isn't per specific user. So for say a warehouse with office space in it, that's the sizing we have to size it by. Uh, it's way more than this user would ever use. Um, you know, it's similar to like a house, uh, say my house is sized for 440 gallons. We don't use nearly that. Uh, it's just the regulatory requirements that we have to um, size these for. Uh, I wouldn't think he's going to even come close to that, probably a quarter of that, if that even. Um, sure. but it's just the, what we have to design to. Okay, I thought you said you were literally expecting to use oh. 800 gallons per day. Yeah. And I thought that was yeah. So. All right. Um, I guess. So, Ian, I know, actually thought, this, Oh, go ahead. Ian, so, I was just going to say, so I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but um, I thought you had some really good questions that you sent in, and I, I would like to get to more of them as well because I think they're similar to some of my questions. So. Okay. I do think we're going to have to come back at some point, so don't feel like you have to get it all out here at your last chance. Okay. Um, okay. But do feel free to comment. I know you had another comment. I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess if this project were to go forward, what is the anticipated time that it would take for uh, construction to be completed? Beth and I talked about that today, and because he has not yet chosen a builder or contractor, um, that's part of what would go into the process. And he would work with his architect, a local here tonight, and they would try to find a builder who can do so within a particular time frame so that it doesn't take unduly long. Uh, Jeff or Alok, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, not particularly. I mean, it, it's it's not a it's not a very large construction project. There is there is adequate you know space to maneuver. This is not a downtown Boston project limited by access, etc. So I would not expect it to be um, overly lengthy. I mean, including all the land work and the building work it you know we've certainly seen projects of this size completed you know well under you know, seven months um but it, it kind of depends on the circumstances of the moment and the contractors etc you have on board um so i wouldn't uh, i'd really have to bring a contractor on board and have them evaluate the particulars of the time and give you a better estimate I guess Harry, I should move to the Cape during that seven months. <laughs> Harry, just back to a comment that you made. Um, and Anne obviously put a lot of thought into this letter. And we review the letter 
we've got architectural, engineering, legal, and, uh, and Jeff's input on this. So if you want, we can go through this and answer most of these very quickly if you don't want to limit the ones. And I think we, you know, in a matter of 15 minutes, I think we can get through all of these. If you okay. prefer, as opposed to having to come back. Well, we're just getting to 10 of 11 and we have a few more things to cover. I think we have to come back anyway, because I do have a question for council. I have some additional questions. Um, let's see about just conditions in general. We have one more public comment, it looks like. So I just want to make sure we don't have to rush through it. Maybe if we're coming back anyway, we can take a look at the any additional questions and, and do it that way. Or otherwise, we might be here till midnight. I just I don't know how the board feels. Are we, do you want us to keep going through? Or Jim, are you able to stay on? Or I think we should quiet? continue it. Okay. <laughs> it's just, we're, we've been going a long time. But I want to give everybody a chance to comment. And Anne, it's certainly if you have something else you wanted to add for right now. No, I'm all set. Okay. Um, okay, great. And then I just have, um, let's see, I'm going to send you back. Um, Tom Reardon, just your name and address. Oh. Oh, we can't hear you, Tom. How about this? Oh yeah, we can hear you. Good evening. You guys are troopers. <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, Seven Sunset Drive. I'm also a member of the Design Review Committee and I was involved with the five meetings with um, Jeff and his team. And some of the comments that were made, I think are somewhat off, off point and that the building is not closer to the residential area. It's, it's well behind the existing Cape uh, and it's shorter than the existing three-story barn. Unfortunately, those two structures haven't been neglected for many decades. And I know that there's a six month demolition delay because of the age of the buildings, but they're not worth keeping, unfortunately. But I'm, I'm very much in favor of this project because of the way they worked with us to create a building that helps transition between the industrial and residential, which is a sensitive location and a difficult design project. Mm -hmm. And Jeff and his team worked well with a design review committee. And I think they came up with a, uh, a very attractive office building that works well with the landscaping. And I think it's a, uh, an asset to the community. So I strongly encourage the planning board to approve this project because uh, this is uh, a good example of collaboration for a quality project in our town. So please wrap this up so we can all go to bed. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and I have one more here. I'm Kristen Wickstead. Hi everyone, Kristen Wickstead to Stirrup Brook Lane. I just had a very quick question um, about the trees on the Bartlett Street side of the property from that black and white um, picture that you keep putting up with all the lines on it. That's really hard to understand. Um, it looks like the building is pretty far away from Bartlett Street. And since you're spending so much time and energy bringing um, mature trees from um, New York, which sounds amazing. Um, there are just several trees that look pretty darn close to the road on the Bartlett Street side that are really big and really mature and um, would probably be more expensive to um, take down if there is a way to work around them. I don't know if they're in the way of all the machines you need coming in and out of there, but it was just a thought that I wasn't sure if you guys had even considered maybe trying to leave as many of those large trees as possible because that seems to um, be something that everybody's interested in is lots of trees. Okay, so your question is about the existing trees there. Is there any yeah. ability or thought about leaving them? So yeah, I particularly are... there's several large pine trees right on the Bartlett Street side, right pretty close to the corner of the property. 
Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Kristen. So I don't know, is that a question for you, David, or, or Vito, is that a question for you of any thoughts on keeping the, some of the trees that are there? Vito, you want to pull up that uh, map? Vito, you're muted. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, they don't show it on the screen, but I just pulled up the review. Uh, is this the ones you were looking at? Right in here. Am I not muted? Am I muted oh, still? No, you know. Okay. <laughs> um, I think this is the this is the Bartlett side. Um, um, you know, so there are these couple on the we'd have to see where those fall, if that works with the landscape design. I don't know what the health of these are. A couple of these don't look great. It looks like there's been some vines. That one doesn't look so great there. We'd have to take a look at them. Uh, I don't think these over on this side work with the design. Uh, it wouldn't possibly be these, but I'm not sure the health and you know if they're going to work with what the overall landscape design would be. Um, so I guess we could kind of take a look at that. Some of the stuff doesn't look so healthy uh, just from street viewing it right now. But mm -hmm. if, if anyone wants, we could always take a look at it. I guess if if we can, I just comment movie. for a second. Sure. Um, yep. So Dave Veron is an arborist, so we're fortunate to have him so skilled as being an arborist as well. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone knows that pine trees, once they get to a certain height and a certain length of time, they just snap and they're just mm -hmm. not really worth preserving. I, I think it would be different. It was a beautiful um, right. maple <laughs> oak, but I think Dave, you can weigh in on this. Yeah, I mean, I'll definitely go in. I mean, of all people, I love to save as many trees as I can. I'm, I'm the biggest advocate of that going. I mean, I take care of some of the most historic trees in Massachusetts. Um, I mean, right up the street at Artemis Ward, that's Sycamore's my baby. Mm. Um, I mean, I have to go in and take a look at them, see what, you know, what we can do, where they lay on the plan for everything and take a closer look. Um, nothing stood out at me before, but definitely it's worth a look. I'll go in and take a peek. All right, maybe just a drive by if it's not a lot of work and you can kind of eyeball it and see if there's any worth saving. That would be nice to know. No problem. Okay, are there, so I want to, we're getting late and I think we're fading. So I want to um, leave the applicant with um, next steps. I think we do need to continue because we have some outstanding questions. And um, I want to make sure our board members have any other, I mean, one thing for me is we looked, we looked a little bit at the loading dock going out of uh, the exit on Lyman Street. I still have a little bit of concern over that exit onto Lyman, just with that corner, um, just safety wise, traffic wise. Uh, I know you widened it to make the turn a little easier. Um, if, the, if the deliveries aren't very often and they're only an 18 wheeler there every three months, is it that impossible to flip that maybe and maybe you already went through the process of doing the flip it sounds like you looked at it but if there's any way to make that work in a different way um, that would alleviate some of my concerns on that corner uh, exiting off on Lyman Street I don't know how other board members feel about that or thoughts on that you know the, the more I think about that <clears throat> particular so I didn't I, I wasn't very fond of the, of the the exit on the Lyman Street side, but the, the more I think about it, it's probably going to be much safer to get onto Lyman Street with people already tooling down to stop for that stop sign, the, rather than people are tooling up to go up Bartlett Hill. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, from a safety standpoint, it probably is not going to be as nice <clears throat> for the abutters, um, but I th think it might be safer. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that or? Yeah, Carrie, I think, I think your question initially in the beginning is what you had for legal counsel had to do with, can this, can this decision follow with the applicant? And I think Jeff has already indicated that he just has a couple coming in the, in the morning and then a couple leaving at night, no different than most people getting a, a delivery during the day. So I think Jeff said it was like four truck deliveries during the day. And then, you know, couple every, you know, two or three months. So it, to me, it's not significant. Mm -hmm. I understand if the 
use was to change and it would be, you know, every hour or, or two or three an hour, but that doesn't seem to be the use that they're, they've applied for or their business model is. Okay. All right, so it sounds like I'm in the minority on that and that's okay. I just want to remind the board that we had said at a prior meeting that only 3% of Jeff's company sales go through this building and 97% are shipped directly from Thailand or China through Amazon. And that's why there were so few deliveries in and out with this building. Okay. Um, all right. So as we, any other board questions or things that we would want to consider going? So I think, um, you know, so these questions that came in from um, Anne, uh, you, you know, I would want to just uh, go through a couple of these next time around. Um, I mean, some of them I think were part of your groundwater special permit perhaps. Um, but it maybe would be just nice to understand. Uh, we may have covered them, I think. I mean, I assume as part of your groundwater special permit, all the snow stuff was covered, snow storage is obviously covered and things like that. Um, but just maybe be curious to hear if there's any concerns of, the, now that you've moved the drive exit a little bit, are there any concern? Your storage is over there as well. So does that change anything? Maybe not. Um, maybe just as a discussion point, not, not a... Um, criteria from our board. Um, and then you mentioned you're going back to conservation. When do you go back to conservation anyway? Um, we haven't filed with them yet. Um, so, you know, I think once we, if we get a favorable decision here or even leading towards a favorable decision, we'd probably start filing with conservation. Okay. Um, we only went there to get a um, determination on the wetlands uh, to confirm all the lines. Okay. Okay, so it sounds like we're just basically we're wrapping up some questions. I have a question for council about um, running when the case where it's a tenant. And if that's not a possibility, I would want to find out what kind of conditions. So the heart of my concern, I think you understand, is that I think that this applicant has done a great deal of work to make a nice project. And I just wanna make sure that this is the, we get the, the um, product that was presented and we don't all of a sudden something changes and we get this completely different project and there's a, a special permit um, blank check out there that you know I, whatever controls we can put in place to make sure that this ex exactly as we approve is what we get in the end, um, that would be helpful to understand. And then if there's some sort of change where all of a sudden the, there's like a use change or there's a tenant change or there's a traffic change, I would want the applicant to have to come back and visit their special permit. So I wouldn't want like, all of a sudden it's a, I don't even know, there's only one truck bay, but whatever the case, I wouldn't want it to change out of control where they didn't have to come back to the board and we had a surprise. I just wanna be mindful of that in that area, especially. Okay, I think everybody's sleeping with their eyes open. So, <laughs> it'd be me. Why don't we make a motion? Does the applicant feel like you have what you, um, your, we know what we need to come back with? Because I want to, I'd like I to. Think so. Okay, uh, why don't we um, mo make a motion to continue this hearing? Um, Kathy, you said you have some stuff on June that you want to. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, it, it should not, for your June agenda, it should not be long. There's just, there's two um, potential applicants that have contacted me that they want to come in. They would like to come into the planning board, similar to what um, we did probably over a year ago with um, Ron Aspro came in to mm -hmm. talk to you about Hudson Street. So there's two different potential appl applicants who would like to come to your next planning board meeting mm -hmm. to talk about um, their, their proposals. Um, one is actually right next door to this at, um, at uh, 200 Bartlett Street. And then um, the other, uh, so that would be, you know, industrial. And then there's another applicant that wants to talk to you about um, doing some um, denser development than what's allowed by the residential bylaws 
um, at 75 Ridge Road. So I, you know, I indicated to them that I would, you know, ask the board if you would be willing to have them come in at your next meeting. So June 1st is your next meeting. So you could continue this, well, right, right off the bat at six o'clock. Um, and then, you know, if, if you want those other um, potential uh, applicants to come in. Um, are they timely, the other two? Or is that something we could flip into the first meeting in July that we have? Or is there something timely coming there or is it? They, well, they're both, uh, one in particular is looking to file, you know, sooner than later, the industrial site. Um, but, you know, again, that, I mean, that's at your discretion as to, as to when you want to entertain this. I mean, okay, yeah. why don't we at least um, book Lyman, so on uh, Lyman Street for the first as a priority. So we'll continue, why don't we plan to continue this hearing, one Lyman Street to June 1st at 6 p.m. To move. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor, Anthony? Aye. Amy? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Millie? Aye. And Carrie's an aye. So, yes, Marshall, did we forget okay, something? I just want to say again to Ann and Steve, if they want to meet with Jeff or Dave, we're making that offer to them. Okay. All right, so I'll let you guys jump off the call so you can go to bed and we'll sort out our schedule separately. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And then the only other thing too, um, I had it's just that time of year where um, every planning board has to file a form with the registry of deeds with your name and your signatures. So the town hall is now open. Uh, we opened up Monday, you know, this past well yesterday <laughs> to the to the public. So if anybody, if you know, I need all five of you um, at some point um, to stop by. I'll have the form um, sitting at Michelle's desk. And, um, you know, just between now and the end of the week, if anyone has the time to come in to sign that. Okay, um, before we get off, I know we have, I'm gonna skip old business for this evening because it's so late, but do board members have a feeling on, do you wanna put those into June 1st or do you wanna hold it? I know we keep going late, so I just wanna be sensitive to that and ask the board's opinion on agenda wise, how you wanna handle that. What else do we have on like the second June meeting? Because we're gonna, the only thing you have on June 1st is one Lyman Street. Um, and well, I shouldn't say the only because then you've got the deliberation for um, Paris. 425 Whitney. Yeah. And then on um, your June 6th, your June 15th meeting, you have the continued public hearing for the definitive subdivision on Bartlett Street. I mean, I'm, I'm, if it's not something like time critical, I'd almost say that first meeting in July because that's those are two monster meetings. Unless board members feel differently, I'm open to different thoughts on that. But did, um, did Kathy, did you say that the 200 Bartlett was more time sensitive? Well, they're they're um, they're interested in you know filing, um, you know if if after they speak with you, they they would like to file um, for their project. So, and I think for either, would it be possible just to, to ask to get a general description of what they're looking for so that we can do some pre preliminary research? Um, well, they, that's what they wanna come in and talk to you about. They, they want to give you an overview of what it is that they're proposing um, and, to, and to get, you know, I, I guess get, to get a read from the board. I mean, I, I don't have any research to do. On, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't do that myself. You know, that's up to them to provide us the information. No, I'm just saying it would be good to go into that meeting with a general idea of what they're looking to do, just so there's no, whatever questions that might be open that we could do, at least do some, as board members, do some preliminary oh, research. I can get you, um, as a matter of fact, I, I already asked one of the um, applicants to, again, potential applicants, um, to send me an email and he did do that. So I, I can forward that to you when he has a, a you know, a sketch of, of what his project would look like. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the, the, the other applicant for Bartlett Street, 
um, I, I can just ask them same thing for, for an email, you know, describing what they want to do. Is that, is that what you mean? That'd be great. Okay. Okay. So in light of time, which meeting, if we want to get the, the Bartlett one on a June meeting, do we, would we rather the first or the 15th? Any thoughts on that? I actually don't think, I think your first meeting on June 1st is going to go by quickly. Okay. Because you've already gone through a lot of what you just went through with the applicant, just answering the questions and then make a deliberation. And then I'm assuming, you know, maybe the deliberation lasts an hour for, if that, for um, <clears throat> Whitney Street. So you got two hours there and maybe you just give them a half an hour, one of them, maybe break it up one now and one on the 15th. Sure, I'm open to that. I was thinking that too, maybe 200 Bartlett on June 1st and Ridge on the 16th. Is it the 15th or 16th? Either oh. way. If, uh, the 15th. Sure, that works. Does that work for everybody? I like it. Okay, let's do that. Um, Quick question. Okay. Do we have anything on the 1st of July? It's July 6th. I was hoping to go on vacation. <laughs> no, there isn't anything yet on the agenda. Maybe we'll take the 4th of July off. <laughs> At least I'm hoping to. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's we'll see how June goes, and then we can <laughs> go on vacation. Okay. Well, that's. Um, I think we'll skip old business. Get to that next time. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to get to it, but I think everybody's ready to go. So if there's Kathy, you have nothing else. We your message is just stop by this week for register your deed signature. Please. Okay. Yep, All right, yep. so everybody needs to do that. And then um, I will entertain a motion to close. Adjourn, motion to adjourn. <laughs> so moved. Second? Second. Okay, all in favor, Anthony? Aye. Amy? Aye. Michelle? Aye. 